Hello, a very warm welcome to everyone. My name is Isabella Spirik. I'm speaking to you as the artistic director of the Negro's Cultural Percentage Dance Festival Steps. Steps was meant to take place between April 23rd and May 16th, presenting 12 dance companies from all over the world throughout Switzerland. 40 venues, 35 villages, towns and cities, 80 performances, in total. The leitmotiv of the festival is identity. As you all know, due to COVID-19, the festival had to be cancelled, including the STEPS meeting point, a whole day which the festival wanted to offer Swiss dance professionals as an opportunity for encounter and exchange. The whole STEPS team including Gabor Varga, quickly came to the decision that it is important we stay in touch no matter what. And that we debate on important topics. To facilitate this, we are organizing all together this panel and are so happy to welcome choreographers, dramaturgs, sociologists on the panel and the public in space. Our discussion is about the influence of COVID-19 on the dance scene, which is globally connected, and how identity can be challenged by this virus and how it will affect the dance world. Thank you very much for all of you for being with us. Let me introduce the people on the panel. There we have Mark Bu dancer, choreographer, and artistic director of Axis Dance Company that develops work through the collaboration of dancers with and without physical disabilities in Auckland, California. Axis would have been one of the companies being presented at STEPS 2020. We have Guy Cools, dance dramaturg, choreographic and dramaturg dramaturgical mentor, curator and lecturer. He has been collaborating with artists, venues and universities all over Europe and Canada. Gilles Jobin, Geneve-based dancer and choreographer who, besides his stage productions, has been a pioneer in developing dance and chore choreography for virtual platforms. Teresa Coloma Beck, she is a sociologist studying globalization and everyday life under condition of crisis. She has undertaken ethnographic field research in Angola, Mozambique and Afghanistan. She is professor for sociology of globalization at Bundeswehr University Munich and currently working as a senior research fellow at the Hamburg Institute for Social Research. Ioannis Mandafunis, dancer and choreographer based in Geneva. Improvisation and connection move, connecting movements to emotions and people is essential in his work. Faded would have been presented at Steps 2020 and will be presented during the next season in Switzerland. Ella Rothschild, choreographer, multidisciplinary artist and dancer born in Israel, currently dancing for Crystal Pite, Kit Pivot. Ella is a resident choreographer at both the Barshnikov Art Center in New York and the Suzanne Delal Center in Tel Aviv. She would have been a choreographer for the Luzern Tanz Ensemble in the framework of Steps 2020. Kylie Walters, dancer, choreographer, and director of choreographic studies at the Conservatoire National Supérieur Musique et Danse de Lyon. Kylie also holds an MA of Science in Public Health. Jing Ji, she's a creator and artistic director of Jing Jing Dance Theater. 
She is the Associate Artist of the Shanghai International Dance Center and jury member of the Lotus Prize. Her company would have been performing within STEPS 2020. The whole panel will be moderated by Monika Scherer, Zurich-based cultural journalist, documentary film director and professional mod moderator. She has worked with the Swiss radio and television for a number of years. We are very happy to have her within among us and I'm happy to give my word to Monika Scherer. Thank you so much. I see. It's like very, very early in California. How are you? I'm good, thank you. And a good morning, good afternoon, good evening, where everyone is. Um, but yeah, I'm in Oakland, California. The sun has come up, so it's a sunny day outside. Have you already moved around? I mean, did you do like exercise in the morning or? Um, the only exercise I probably got was going to the kettle and pouring myself a cup of tea. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> For now. Okay, so we move on to the person who's actually almost ready to go to bed. That's Xi Xin. Did I pronounce it right? Xie Xin. Yeah, it's, it's really good. Xie Xin. Nice. <laughs> hey. How, how, how was your day? Is there still lock, lockdown in Shanghai or how is the situation? Uh, actually, we almost back to normal life and my company already starts working for two months already. So it's getting better. It's getting better. Nice to hear that. Yeah. We move on mm -hmm. to Teresa Coloma Beck. Um, Teresa, are you in Munich, right? No, I'm in Hamburg. Actually. You're in Hamburg? Okay. Why I'm, do I know? Why do I thought? Somewhere in Germany. <laughs> you, you, you do, I mean, you're a sociologist. You're not a dancer. You're not a choreographer in that group. The two of us actually, they're the only ones who can't move. Um, tell me, Teresa, you're also a researcher. So, so Corona time, the lockdown, so gave you a lot of time to do a lot of research? <laughs> yeah, well, I could tell now a lot of things about uh, how it is to try to keep up with the researcher's life while having kids at home. Uh, and uh, we are frequently talking about the home office and the homeschooling front. Um, it's not so easy, but the funny thing for me was that in many moments I felt I have had, had seen a lot of the things that were happening before because I'm researching uh, everyday life in war societies and there are many similarities. So I had a lot of deja vus. Mm. Um, throughout this time. Thank you, Teresa. We'll hear you also a little bit later um, in this webinar. Guy Kools, welcome to this webinar. Where are you at the moment? Uh, I'm looks in like, a... Looks like an underground. It is a kind of small studio space that I use sometimes to work in. Uh, and it has a better internet connection and like Teresa, I have a two year and a half son at home. So if he would be around, he would be a lot in, uh, there would be a lot of noise from him. And just correcting, like I'm Belgium, so originally, so my name pronounces the French way, Guy. In, uh, Guy, that's right. That's Guy right. Cool is a bit, it's a bit too, uh, we talk English, yeah, too right. random. Like. <laughs> Guy, Guy Cools, you're a dramaturg? Yes. Uh, so home office is like, it came in handy, so you had to do a lot of research and studies also? Uh, basically, I'm, I'm, I mean, already before the, the COVID-19 crisis, I, I, I'm basically do, doing production dramaturgy. So I'm, I'm coaching and mentoring choreographers in their work. Um, and half the time I'm in the studio with them, but in between rehearsals, uh, because I work in very different countries, it already became quite normal to do a lot of online uh, sessions with them and that continues for sure okay we will hear Guy calls um let's say around 6 p.m central europe time and last but not least we have uh Ioannis Mandofunis. um Yannis, your tour has been cancelled your workshops has been have been cancelled um how do you keep in shape well, we are very lucky in Switzerland because uh, we, they didn't really close us in doors. So we could still go out. If you were alone in the studio, you could actually go. Or actually the funny thing that if you were with uh, until five people, but you could keep two meters distances from your other dancers, <laughs> you could even rehearse, which is actually a, 
almost impossible in dance, but I was alone, so I could actually train and I could even uh, like prepare my next pieces. So I have to say, uh, we are very lucky in Switzerland to have had this kind of situation. Absolutely. And last but not least, I would like to also address Isabella Spiric. I mean, you wanted to have a festival that a lot of audience could show up and now sort of, it's like a big, big hole, big gap, or what happens in your, in your sort of daily life? Well, um, on an em emotionally, I'm, I'm incredibly sad, as you can imagine, because it's, it's really a, a, a loss if you lose a festival, because there is been two, two years of preparation. So that's, that's really a big sadness for everyone who would have been involved. So, but the daily business in home office, it's, it's very hectic. So it's, there's a lot to do um, and a lot of questions to answer. So I have like these two being in the hectic and, and having some moments of just being sad. But today I'm very happy because at least some moment of the festival, we're gonna share all together. So that makes me happy. Yes, and we have a wonderful crowd here. And I would like to start this webinar and uh, the discussion. And we would have a first input um, speech by Jill Job Gilles Jobin. And he prepared, I think, something and he will tell us more about his work. He already mentioned he's a, not a digital native, but become a digital complete immigrant, I would say. Um, uh, he has his, uh, his, his company and, and he, is, was the first resident choreographer who was a resident choreographer at the CERN, at the Nuclear Research Center in Geneva. Um, he, he has at the moment, or there was a Sundance Film Festival dance train, a dance piece in augmented reality. So he is really a master when it comes up to VR and um, Jill, we're really excited to hear what you tell us about analog, digital, what happens post-corona, how creative can we be? Please. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to try. I'm going to try to start. Um, yes. I mean, <clears throat> for me, uh, I started to have some interest in, in the VR around 2016. And it's because I discovered motion capture studio that was in Geneva. And I, I found so fascinating the, the, the capture of movement and, and the possibility to reproduce this movement inside the virtual space. So I thought that, that really we were... Uh, you know, to the point to have new spaces available for us, for dance, for performance. And uh, thanks to the technology, the technology was becoming more available. Uh, everything that was like very complicated to do maybe 15 years ago became like consumer. Uh, so, you know, the development of the computers, everything is faster. So we can do, we can do much more things, much easier and much cheaper. So I thought, you know, there's really something and the question about the constant traveling of bodies uh, into space and geographies and across countries also can be problematic after a while. And, and I thought, you know, maybe there is other ways uh, to, 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 to move and other ways to send the body uh, across the world uh, in, in different ways. So in 3D was very interesting, a 3D movie called Womb, uh, but that has the, you know, it's cinema, so cinema is more fixed, it's more difficult. Uh, then the 3D space is very interesting. You use, you know, you can use Unity game engines, they're very flexible, and it's something that you can constantly rework. So it has this kind of, it's very similar to what we do with the dance piece. When you do dance piece, you can retouch it every time you rehearse, you can make some modification. And then in VR, actually, also, it's quite easy to get back into your project, make small modification and make an upgrade. So what I was thinking to do is to go like to go a quick presentation of what I do because you know maybe it's easier to see some examples. So I'm going to try to launch my uh, PowerPoint. So I'm going to tell me if you see. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, I have first to share my screen. Okay, and you're going to tell me if it's fine. It's not the right one. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, so I started with the image because this is what my company is now. My company was a dance company. Now it's the Radeau de la Meduse. And because uh, it has been, a, uh, frankly, a disaster for us. I mean, all our gigs have been canceled. My production real time has been canceled a month and a half before the opening. So um, I think this draft kind of represents uh, uh, the virtual world. So for us, is maybe something we're going to try to hold on. 
and we're going to try to produce more virtual work because we think that uh, for a while that's going to really uh, be one of the solution is not the solution but for us uh, because we are a better experience it can be one solution so uh, my company it looks more like this like uh, you know like now what we do there's a lot of technology involved i have some equipment to do motion capture in my own studio so now I'm really controlling the full pipeline so I can do the motion capture, I can put the, the, the images to Unity, I have my 3D artist and I have uh, my developer team. So I can, I'm really like autonomous now. Uh, so that's that, it took me a while, but now we are kind of experienced. Um, and even some of the, the, some of the people from my company got trained at, at using Unity, like Susanna, which is one of the, she's the lead dancer of my company. and. Uh, and now she's doing the integration into Unity. So we really have uh, also this kind of formation uh, idea to bring people into also using new tools uh, and to be expert in movement, but inside a, a game engine, for instance. So tech director is, is becoming a mocap master now, so uh, motion capture master. So we, we really kind of use it as a tool, uh, which for us is a similar tool to what we do on stage or what we do on a, on other platforms, it's just a new new space for us. So I'm gonna uh, maybe shoot a little video uh, and then go through some of my work. So this is a piece called VRI, which I did in 2017. And it's a piece in VR, uh, it, it's an immersive piece. So you can see the people that are equipped with a backpack and the headsets, and they can see their own bodies uh, and they can react to each other, they can talk to each other. So it's a very, uh, um, a strong sensation for the people and, and, and strangely enough we had a lot of uh, um, uh, people talking about the experience they had with their own body. This is for you Isabella and Mark because you know I know you work with inclusiveness and, and our piece is also inclusive because we even have an avatar for uh, wheelchair users. So you know it's really about you know in, in integration. So now this is another piece in an augmented reality piece called Magic Window which is in Lausanne is a location base so you have to, to to scan a marker with your phone, download the app, scan a marker, and then you can see dancers that are coming inside the real world. So if in VRI you would be invited into their world, in this case, you can invite them into your world. And then we did this piece called Dance Trail, which the, that's, we just recently uh, uh, opened at Sundance in, uh, in January. And this is a similar, but the difference is that you can place the dancer wherever you want. So by, you see, this is, this is for Isabella also, this is Robert, I, I, I'm sure you love him. So you, can, you see, you can, you can place dancer anywhere you, anywhere you want. Um, and this is in front of the ADC, which is under construction and this building work is stopped uh, because of, uh, of the COVID. And this is the real time, this is the piece that we, that, that interrupted. So in this case, we have uh, two dancers, a duo with uh, Susanna and Mael. And it, there is a motion capture in real time and projection. You can see, I mean, it's quite obvious that they're being, their bodies being a motion capture and you can see their images. And this is a project that we're just finishing now, which is like comedy, another beautiful theater that is uh, being closed. I mean, not open because uh, building work has been uh, interrupted because of the crisis. And uh, what we did is to modelize the full theater so you can uh, go inside the theater uh, in, into the different pieces in VR, but we're gonna try to find some other ways also to, um, uh, to bring uh, this uh, building to life. And so what I'm really interested in is motion capture. And I think when you see those images, you can understand why I'm so interested into motion capture. Okay, so this, this is like an experiment that we did like not so long ago. So what we do here, we, we are uh, mocapped in my house in Geneva and we send the data, the raw data to Camilo, which is in Fribourg and uh, Switzerland. And then he re-injected into a Unity uh, 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 program and then he sends us um, a video feedback. Uh, so that's quite interesting because that's part of a new project that we're trying to develop, which is to create uh, to connect with clusters of artists. There's actually, we have a plan to do something in Shanghai, uh, in Buenos Aires and other, other cities. And it's really about connecting cluster of artists to work remotely, remotely and simultaneously using those collaborative tools uh, that we have now available. Um, so now there's all these new ways, you know, so there's new kind of new spaces that are coming out. And there's some really crazy, crazy, amazing experiences 
Um, there was a recently this concert from Travis Scott on Fortnite. Fortnite is a, is a game that you play online and kids are really crazy about this game. And you have like the really lot of users. So there's, you know, people go to a server and they, they, they are 100 people at a time uh, into one space. And there's like a multi, multiple space around the world. So what they did is to make a concert of this uh, rapper. Um, and he's uh, funny, he, I mean, he's a big giant, very useful. So everybody can see uh, from the world. And it, there's been 12 million spectators for this. And I think in three or four days, they had like 27 million people. Okay, so it's a rap concert, but you can see the potential of, you know, online games as new spaces also for performing arts. Um, so that's, you know, some new possibilities. And also I've been investigating uh, lately uh, around, you know, this kind of what we're doing now, which is this kind of Zoom conferences or Skype or whatever, Google Hangout. So there is some new system that are coming out. Uh, now there's, uh, I mean, if people are interested, I can give you the links of some conferences that came out about these, like new ways to communicate. Because, you know, we, you, we, you know that if you do a lot of Zoom, you become like totally crazy. It's very difficult for us to concentrate with so many faces. It's something that is really disturbing us nervously. So we feel very tired. So people are trying to find new ways so one of the new way, which I found quite interesting, I didn't put the video, but you can find it if you go on the internet, it's called Spaces VR. And the idea is that you can be, so you are in VR with VR goggles and we, you, will see, you will see my avatar. And this avatar can move around objects and screen and things. So it's like in a 3D space. So he can like move the camera, show things to people. So it's an interaction between a real live avatar and, and, and real people. So that's quite useful to share information. Um, then there is this one. Uh, this I put the little video, and this is, uh, oh, I left the sound, I think. Uh, this is, uh, this is a, a gathering that's called Laval Virtual, that, that's around VR and, and tech. So they, 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 they use this space from uh, Virbella, and then you can be like, it's like, a, like an island, and you can walk about with an avatar, it's a bit like Second Life, and you can walk about and meet people. Uh, like in, in, so you can do it in VR, but you can also do it on your PC or on your Mac. It's web based. So, uh, no, it's a program you have to download, but I mean, it works quite well. I went into it the other day and I, to tell you the truth, I was quite skeptical. I was like, yeah, whatever. That's so old, so 90s, you know. And then uh, I went into it and then I saw some people, they were talking. You can hear people, what they talk about. And, um, then they saw my name because I have my name and they said, oh, Gilles Jobin, you're a dancer. Uh, uh, why don't you join the, this, the conversation? And then I joined the conversation. I had this conversation with these people about movement and stuff. And it was quite strange to be in my home, in my bed, communicating with people, like if I was at the Swiss dance days or as a step uh, symposium, you know, like, like the chit chat, like, you know, by chance you meet someone and something happened, you meet new people, people that know you, you know, it was a professional encounter. So I knew people and some people knew me. So I thought that, that that's, that's quite interesting. Uh, that's a quite interesting way to, to kind of connect differently. So there is different formats that we can uh, now kind of uh, get uh, to communicate. So that's a little bit, I wanted to, I'm, I'm finishing Gabo. So, <laughs> I, I just wanted to uh, kind of show a bit what, I've, how I've been moving with the, on the digital world and how the digital world is becoming, you know, what was some kind of a side project is becoming my main project, and how those new tools can be spaces for pre presentation, but also space theoretical spaces where we can meet and gather and and kind of substitute. Because I think one of the problems that not so many people talk about with the COVID is also the traveling. The traveling might be restricted for a couple or maybe two or three years, we don't know. And the costs also might be unaffordable for our economy and the way we've been touring like crazy all those years. So, you know, that these kind of technology I think are interesting, even though, even if the situation gets better, we will need more of those things because we might not be able to travel. Or we just don't want to travel so much anymore. Thank, Thank you. you very much, uh, Gilles. I would like to open the discussion to the panels, to the panelists. Some inputs, some questions. 
Um, thanks, Jill. That was okay. absolutely yeah. fascinating. And should I say who's tall? You, Gabor? You? Oh, yeah, maybe. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I cut the sound. Sorry. So I was not hearing you guys. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Kelly, please. Yes. Yeah, thanks, Jill. That was really fascinating. And, and it's a great point you bring up about, you know, this may be this sort of restriction of travel, maybe something that we have to deal with for quite a long time. So this offers a kind of alternative um, space, this kind of work that you're developing and that is out there. And yeah, I mean, the possibilities are kind of quite mind blowing in terms of, uh, yeah, audience sizes and, and, you know, how you can walk into new spaces, communicate at, um, over long distances, etc. cetera. Um, afterwards, you're quite practiced in all of this, but um, I would be really interested if, you know, if you could share some of those addresses and stuff, and then I can pass them on to my students, for example. I know Jill's already come and intervened in front of our students for us, and yeah, it's, it's a whole new field, which is really exciting, like of opportunities for dance and, and how oh, yeah. body comes into the virtual space. I mean, space. for dancers to move, for the choreographers to do new projects, but also as it's interesting to learn. I think it's interesting for dancers now to have some, some initiation on, in motion capture, and these kind of technologies, because they are the tools of the future. So they need to know that they exist and that they're not so complicated. And by the way, the dancers have very good intuition for this kind of spaces because they're 3D spaces and we are masters of spaces. So we have good skills that we can we can use in i'm not even talking about reconversion but just just you know just to use it as a tool jill there is a question from the audience from a casper kramis from geneva he wants to know virtual dance is like virtual life how do we come back to a reality dance show i don't know uh, I mean, if I would know, uh, I would, you know, promote my, my, my stage pieces. Now, I don't really believe, I mean, it's very difficult for me to talk with an organizer that asked me to do a piece in October or November. You know, VRI is like a totally Corona incompatible piece. You put headsets on the head of people and you have, you know, so I don't know about when we're going to start to, to back to some kind of normality. So I'm, I'm not saying that the virtual world is, is the world, is the thing to do. It's just that for me, it's something that I can do. And I think there is some interest and there is, you know, I have some interest from festivals like that are calling me because they have, they need an alternative program. So they're happy to have done straight, for instance, they did it at the Fête de la Danse in Brussels. So, you know, there is possibilities, I think, to the virtual, but I don't see it as, is not a substitution or it's just something else. It's just, it's like, you know, television is television, cinema is cinema and radio is radio. It's just like, I don't, it's just a new media, new spaces available. You know, in the, in the 60s in New York, they started to dance, dance on the roofs. That was like, nobody would dance on the roof. And now anyone can dance on the roof. It's not, you know, it's, so it's just, it's just a new moment. It's just, it's, 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 it's just that the digital world is taking a bit more importance now. Uh, but like these kind of uh, social spaces, like before the crisis, like nobody would go, they were there, but it was very difficult to make people really see how useful it is. Ioannis? Yeah, no, just uh, maybe a little, because I, I was an audience member to one of those projects. So I put the goggles on and I was in this 3D space and everything. And I have to say that uh, for sure, there are a lot of questions. Uh, because, for example, me as a dancer, and we talked about it with Gilles when I was in Zurich, I couldn't move at all because all my senses were like, uh, like, like it was a new experience. And uh, I never play, I don't even have television, so I never play games even on my computer. So for me, for example, it was really like a new experience. And suddenly I was inside this like strange world. And uh, I, that's what I said. I said, I would like to go back two or three times until I start thinking okay maybe i should do this or maybe i could experience this or i could experiment with that so it's not something it's something that is really evolving and this is what i think is nice is that first of all you have to get in contact with your emotions and your sensations before you actually start experimenting so it's like uh, for me that was really a positive thing to not know exactly where it can go but to know that we still need the human being to experience it in order to 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 do something with it I maybe have a question uh, from the audience that goes into the same direction. It's Maria Alexis. The interesting, she says, the interesting aspects of digital communication are obvious, 
what do we do with the nonverbal energetic aspects of communication? As a dancer and a choreographer, I realize how much we rely on it in our work. Maybe Jill? I don't know. I mean, like, you know, we have to do what we can with what we have, you know? Uh, you, you know, not a digital native, as you said, I used to have a telephone, you had to go people you know and, and that's how we used it and then we are like oh, oh, pushing buttons and, and now we have this you know so you, you're just a learning curve you know we get used i think so many people like you said never did this kind of thing but now like so many people will have done it so i think we're going to make a big leap in no uh, people will be more knowledgeable in terms of those uh, technologies because now they see how useful and also see the limits so they want to change they want to make them better like more human so one way to answer the question maybe those avatars things because if i was standing you know and i could move like more with my arms maybe i could like be a bit more interesting to see than just my little square thing so maybe the format of how we see maybe we need to involve the whole body in those uh, discussions so you know this maybe this format is not the good format maybe it should be like this actually <laughs> thank you so much Hill. um I have to admit, I, I had the chance to also uh, experience V1 or VR1, it's called, right? VR I, I. And um, VR I, and it was, um, un, I mean, I, unforgettable for me. I mean, I felt like someone else. Let's move on and let's stay with the same um, analog, digital, more or less that world. But I would like to move on to Ella Rothschild in Tel Aviv. Uh, Rothschild, uh, Ella, you are a dancer, choreographer, you write, you sing, you sculpt, you dance, you like to, um, you say only one discipline is unsatisfactory to you, um, you do a lot of collaboration with uh, musicians, with video artists, even with puppeteers, so you would have been at the Steps Festival with the choreography, um, which is I am who I am who I am. Um, unfortunately, we can't see that one, but tell us about your thoughts um, and your world and what you can share in, on this topic, creativity post-corona. Okay. Um, it's very interesting for me to hear Jill's um, lecture before because I'm almost taking it to the other side of the, of the thing uh, we're talking about. Um, yeah, I'm um, doing all what you said, like I am a choreographer, an independent choreographer in Israel. And as you imagine, um, the instruments in the toolbox that I have are dancers and the working space that I'm working in is usually the studio, even though I have all those um, other disciplines that I'm working on. And in this um, uh, time that we are shifting into the online uh, sphere, uh, what is interesting for me is that many of the times the transformation to the digital world uh, brings the me meta, um, which means for me to talk about art, the, the making of, the documentary uh, on art. And this is also, an, um, this panel is also a good example, example for it, that I'm talking about my art or about art in a general way, but I'm not presenting it or doing it. Um, I feel that this is some consequences that our community experienced due to COVID-19, uh, which is for me uh, interesting. Uh, I want to start with, uh, with Kafka. This is something I heard in a different kind of le lecture, but I think it's beautiful and connected to what I want to share with you. Um, the first time Kafka is uh, going to the Kaiser Pan Panorama, which is the first cinema, is describing the, the, how he's like smelling the perfume of the woman that sits next to him. And this takes me to the, the subject of theater being an holistic experience and the observation uh, of the fundamental difference between the online and the offline experience. Uh, for me, this period is I'm overwhelmed by the amount of content that I can only reach online. But then, at the same time, it doesn't replace for me the theatrical experience, uh, whether if it's traditional theater or dance or political theater or interactive theater. And being said that, as a choreographer per personally, I do feel the internal and external pressure 
to kind of um, reach a certain productivity, even though I don't have my usual basic uh, tools, which I usually work with. Um, the fact that Shakespeare uh, wrote King's Lear during a plague is also not a really uh, a helping point in terms of the pressure of producing art uh, in that moment. Um, the overflow I see in social medias uh, of artistic content makes me feel that it's kind of an act of proving the existence and the relevance of us as artists. But in a way, for me, it doesn't matter how much content I put online in my feed or in my YouTube channels. Um, I think that the uniqueness in our art and something that is essential and initial in the theatrical experience is the assembling, um, which now uh, denied from us. Um, and the performance, the experience in the performance is, is neutral to the performers and to the audience. Um, uh, so in that, in that point, um, I believe that there is a third kind of dimension that is being created uh, when there is a performance. It's not just about the artist. Uh, experience or the viewer experience there is another dimension that is being created and it's just because we're in the same space in the same time with a certain action that we share um, it's a one lifetime experience and the singularity experience um, as, as I see it the singularity moment is the main virtue of the dance and the, the dance and theater have uh, over other maybe art forms, and it's the transformation of the singularity uh, of the moment to the online uh, sphere uh, that is now the challenge that we have to face. And I'm asking the question: How can I do it with the tools that I have? Um, and well. From my own personal point of view, I feel that I'm maybe other people can relate to it. I consume today my news, uh, sweet and cute uh, videos of cats and dogs, coronagraphs, and artistic uh, content on the same platform. Everything uh, gets the same importance for me. And by that, I feel um, that. Uh, I lose a little bit the diversity of the experiences we can have. Um, there is a difference between seeing something real than seeing it through the screen. There is a difference between feeling a texture uh, than seeing an image through a screen. Um, there is a difference between feeling the sense of time and uh, attention span between the words uh, of online and offline. And eventually there is a difference between going to the theater and smelling the perfume of the person sitting next to you than to sit in your home uh, in front of your screen and smelling whatever you cooked uh, in the last few hours from your, in, in your own kitchen. Um, eventually, uh, um, I, talk, I talk a lot about the in, importance of the holistic experience of theater and how important it, important it is for me. But I do believe that we exist in the online and offline world. And the borderlines are getting, um, and sometimes not clear where are the borderlines. Uh, and therefore, I feel it's important that our art will flourish in both of those worlds. Um, so I think that to kind of conclude my feeling, the theater, you know, it's, survived dictatorship and uh, plagues and all those things. And I do hope it will uh, survive the Zoom. Um, and this is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. Yes, um, I pass it on to Guy. First of all, I mean, I liked, uh, again, both Shields and Ella's presentation as opposites. And personally, I'm much more on, on Ella's 
a site. I mean, that's why I chose mid 30 years ago, the theater experience and the dance experience. Um, but I also see the potential of, of the new technology. I want to just uh, also to the audience, um, ITM just put online, I think yesterday, um, a, a document about analog and virtual post COVID. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's a seven page document, which summarizes, I think very well, all the, the arguments. Um, there was one thing I, I did, um, a question, I mean, for Jill or Ella, uh, but there's also something that Kylie said before, is that it seems to very much that the online, to go online now is being pushed because it's very much connected to less mobility. Um, ecological between question marks, because like the ITM document says, also the online experience costs, has a carbon footprint that we're not aware of. Uh, it's also about uh, who has access to uh, the accessibility because what you put online is mediated by providers. Uh, they can decide to take off your online uh, content. Uh, I mean, not everybody has the privilege uh, to have a, a good connection and a computer. Um, so, the question is like, okay, it seems to be that online experience is, is a solution for mobility issues. Now they're related to COVID, but there's also a way by the certain agendas we're pushing this because it's economically cheaper. For instance, also in education, uh, they're pushing it to keep the online education after this is over. And it's just uh, because of economical principles. And I question, because uh, there's a live experience, the liveliness, but there's also the mobility that's such an important aspect of our work. Uh, so wouldn't it be an extreme reduction if, we, if, if this mobility would really be long-term uh, limited like that? I mean, it's maybe a question to all of us, like. Uh, do you want to go, Ella, or? No, please, go. Uh, <clears throat> well, there's a few things. Um... First, I don't think it's a side, you know, it's, like, it's not like there's a side which is the digital and the side which is the live. I think it's just new tools. It's like, you know, having video on stage is not like you know, very surprising. It may be it was 20 years ago, but not anymore. So it's just new tools. I don't, I don't see it as, you know, for me now, it's just because of the situation that takes me out of the stage. So I'm, I'm kind of like investing more in the digital side because I see it as a, as a, as a raft to save my company, you know, more than anything. Uh, uh, for me, it's, both is the same. I, I, I thought it was interesting what you were saying Ella, about the theory. And it's true that I think in dance and contemporary dance, we miss a lot of theory and we don't have a lot of, we're not talking people so much. And, and a lot of the work is around, you know, making work on stage and we don't talk so much about how we do, we don't have so many platforms. So true, I also saw that. And I think that's one of the positive things that's happening. There's more talks, more artist talk, tech talk, a lot of different talk actually. Uh, also, I like what you said about the seeing, you know, stupid do dogs and stupid things and COVID stuff and also art stuff on Facebook. It seems that there is a tendency now. There is a, like a, a, like social networks that are like speci specific for a type. Uh, we have one which is called Geneva Dance Training in Geneva. There's one which is called Dance Tech. I think Isabel, Isabel knows because Marlon Barrios was in charge of this. I think he was part of steps at some point. And now he's kind of reviving this social network. He's seeing that people are fed up and they want to be on a social network only with, you know, same kind of people that talk in the same subject. It's more interesting, you know. So I think that's also a possibility for you and for everybody to start to create our own social network around the subject that interests us. Um, and then, you know, but the, you know, I'm not like a Jérôme Bell fan. I think that's really a bit silly from him to have this position of saying I'm not traveling anymore to save the planet. I don't think contemporary dance has a lot of responsibility on the on the CO2 in the planet. It's really ridiculous what we do. But still, I did a little calculation that uh, like a one edition of the Swiss Dance Days, uh, approx more or less, it's a rough estimate, but all the invited guests corresponds to three years of touring of a five people company. So that just gives you a proportion of, of what can be avoided, where do you save? So it's not me, not touring that's going to save, but maybe if we don't have those so many people coming from so many places at the same time, we do save 
a bit of energy and also, yeah, the money, yes. But, you know, now, like, for instance, like a film festival, you go to Cannes, it's going to cost three or 4,000 euros. To be three, four days in Cannes, you're going to... So, you know, do you... Do people will want to continue. You know, I think that's a good question. Is this experience giving us new possibilities? And I hope I will travel and I hope I will hug everybody. But uh, meanwhile, maybe there is alternative and you know i've been traveling too much personally my life is just like a like a cut of i lose one week of rehearsal like it's a problem two weeks is a disaster and three three weeks i'm fucked you know so that's not normal you know i shouldn't have so much problem in the creation my time is too sliced about by you know i would have had to go to Bern or somewhere to do the same uh, meeting i'm really happy to do that at home <laughs> at home and that i have to travel so you know there's some advantages also mm -hmm. um Teresa. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thanks for both presentations. I just wanted to, wanted to point to the political dimension of what is discussed here. Um, to me, it is very clear, and I think this is nothing we really, there will be no controversy about um, that for people who used to interact uh, in a space as people being present with their physical bodies, this situation that we have now is, of course, a loss. Um, of course, we don't have to travel, but uh, at one point we will we miss um, this kind of interaction with people. But um, so somehow the virtual feels like um, an insufficient uh, or a, a, a not satisfying substitute. But we can also switch the perspective and think it think of it as something that might us put in a position might put us into a position to connect with people whom we are not yet connected. So my research has brought me to places where I over and over again made this very hurtful experience that I couldn't reconnect to people. So um, there were people who were essential in researches in Afghanistan, in Mozambique, and I cannot just reconnect to them, neither personally nor to do further research. Um, and actually I would happily put on we are glasses to interact with them <laughs> virtually and it would be a gain an immense an immense gain in professionally as well as personally then not to be able to meaningfully interact with them um, and when i saw jill what you showed um this project which might result in people in different cities moving and actually doing the, a dance piece together while not being in the same physical space. Um, I mean, I'm not from the field, but for me, it felt visionary, not only for the field of dance, but for many other uh, spheres of life. And there is a political dimension because even before Corona, there are people in, uh, there are places in the world that are disconnected because they are insecure. But due to technology, uh, you might not be able to travel there but there is in the urban centers internet, sometimes better internet than we have in the urban centers in some German cities. Thank you very much, Teresa. I think we're probably gonna continue also when we talk about interaction with audience and how to get the audience in and networks will definitely and post corona practice um, more about this. I have one question for Ella, specifically from the audience. I would like to address it to you. It comes from, um, Zara Wuki, or Wu, yeah. thanks Ella for your clear and moving share as a dance artist I relate and appreciate. And then the question is, I wonder if you can speak more to the idea of transformation of singularities and holistic experience. Are these related or different ideas for you? So I mean, very I, question. I think I think they are completely connected because the the I mean the singularity of a certain moment that we experience uh, that the how to say the temporary uh, action that we're doing as performers it's connected I feel it's a part of the holistic feeling because this is it's connected to the one uh, one in a lifetime experience so the fact that we know whatever happens happens now and it will never be the same it will never happen exactly the same so this is also a part of the the whole experience of theater which includes much more than what i said it includes also all all the preparation before you are arriving to the moment that 
uh, you share the singular moment. The, you know, you're buying the tickets for the theater, uh, you're walking to the theater, um, you're drinking the, in the, uh, drink in the bar before, you're entering, you sit in your seat, and for the performers and the choreographers, it's the months of preparation before. And then, then uh, occurs the one uh, singularity moment that, is, that we are all uh, sharing. Um, so I think they are connected. Ella, there's another question coming from Guillaume. Um, he is talking about what you mentioned, the Kafka sent attention, um, and he wonders what the place of the kinetic haptic senses in this new COVID, COVID scene times of performance practice will be. Can we redefine the terms of engagement in real or physical space? Ah, um, well, I hope I understood the question. <laughs> Um, it, it, okay, it doesn't mean, does it mean that, uh, that if we can redefine the, our space, the physical space that we are working in? Let me see again. Can we <sighs> redefine the terms of engagement in physical mm -hmm. space? Um, I think that we're, we, maybe something that Gilles said, that you are constantly changing, like things that happens around us and the environment that we're a part of, uh, we are, we are bound to change and we are and also as artists it's part of our being to constantly transform and uh, learn new um grounds to work with and new ways to kind of uh be creative so i think that it, there will be a change i don't know what it what how it will look like and, but I think that already things are changing and in there and even what Jill said before that he, you know, he has a work in October and he doesn't know if he, if he wants to do it with the, you know, putting the headphones or the, um, so yeah, I mean, I hope I answered the question. Thank you so much, Ella. Um, the audience, just to let you know, we're at the webinar steps, uh, the, the dance festival taking place in Switzerland, organized by Migro Culture Percent. Uh, percentage, we are not um, real, we're virtual, but we're having this discussion and we would like to move on um, with, let's say, post practice post-corona practice. And I would like to address uh, Kylie Walters. You were going to have a little speech on that issue specifically. Kylie Walters, director and, uh, um, of chore choreographic studies at Conservatoire de Lyon. So you also have to do with students. You're teaching, you're giving, passing on your knowledge. Um, but you also have like a background in um, public health. Let's not mention everything you did with the Red Cross and everything and uh, traveled uh, the world. And you launched She Moves events, which is an international event dedicated to women's rights. That's also not what we're talking today, but maybe that has an influence in what you're talking about, um, uh, the post-corona practices and your thoughts on uh, down scene and uh, creativity with this experience of the lockdown of of a different, in a way, a different world. Please, Kylie Walters. Yeah, thanks, Monica, and um, and and thanks, Steps, for the invitation, which is, as Ella said, a perfect example of creating new communities and networks during um, COVID nineteen. Um, to me, it's kind of like this whole lockdown, social distancing thing, kind of smacks of like a choreographic score. And it's, I was thinking it's almost as if Yvonne Rayner had been allowed to take over the world for two months and she kind of went on a choreographic bender. And I'll come back to Yvonne Rayner a little bit later because I think her work gives us some clues as to how we might kind of move forward in this, you know, new radical um, biopolitic Space that we're that we're living. Um, I was thinking as well that it's just like walking the street to buy some groceries has become kind of this um, heightened physical and performative act as we return to a form of embodied presence after being locked up in our houses and behind our screens and Zoom conference um, uh, meetings. And what I find really fascinating actually is to see how the choreographic 
the choreographic, the choreographic concepts that we work with every day, you know, um, heightened proprioception, spatial organization and awareness, passing through avoidance, movement flux and flow and suspension and release are now kind of regulating our daily lives and our experience of our urban and um, constructed spaces and relationships. So my keynote's going to address networks, corporations, um, artistic community and how it may evolve in um, the future alongside COVID-19. And I think the most important network of all is, of course, the network of all living creatures that we share our air and our water with. Um, and I'll also bring up some key issues, which Ella's already touched on and Jill, which is, you know, can we truly replace embodied presence in our art form, in dance? And how are we going to engage with artists and how in turn are those artists going to be able to um, get their work to public and to, to the audience? Um, it's also a new era that seems to be overthrowing the old, this is a horrible word, but hegemony of, of the too big to fail theater festivals and, and you know, what other forms of gathering or assembly um, may exist or can we invent that are either in phase or perhaps in resistance to other mutations in our society that we see happening, like shifts from industrial to cyber, um, shifts from, embodied to um, disembodied or immaterial, um, from hard border control to kind of digital and media control, all of which have really come into sharp focus with this pandemic. So in terms of networks bringing together of artists and um, audiences, they've kind of persisted since time in memorial. I think of corroborees, I think of tribal dance gatherings and the agora of ancient Greece. And I. I think these physical assembly moments really play an important role in how we socially experience and regulate our world. So I don't think they're gonna disappear completely, um, but I think the modalities will change as we become more wary and more selective about attending kind of, you know, super spreader events. Um, it's a gross word, I know. I'm, I'm envisaging a shift to favor kind of more local and regional um, networks and initiatives and bilateral projects and partnerships will also probably come to the fore. I think redressing that kind of local slash national slash international um, um, balance um, will help become a sort of insurance policy because exchange possibilities will also be determined by a city's health system capacity and also a city's outbreak status. Um, so I'm thinking more agile, more flexible, diverse options and, and programming options. And I think this is a good thing, you know, more locally sourced offerings rather than the kind of supermarket distribution models that big companies and choreographers dominated festival or theatre scenes and programs worldwide. And success was kind of measured by how many touring dates in how many countries and how many university partnerships you could rack up. Um, and I think, but going deeper, um, that will also impact creative production methods and performance models. So we might, this is like, you know, this is totally speculative, but we might start to rely more on pickup companies or local versions of creative blueprints or scores, um, a little along the lines of Yvonne Rayner's um, continuous project Alter Daily, for example, or say um, today a choreographer like Emmanuel Gatz works series, or maybe we'll see more private dances, a bit like peep shows, you know, with people in cabins or one-on-one -on -one experiences or downloadable bite-sized dances that we see on Instagram, busking, you know, outdoors, um, where social distancing is much easier. You know, busking may come to be considered as a high art. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that, you know, programmers will start to be thinking about offering outdoor performance forms as a main offering rather than a side dish, which was kind of the case before. We're also getting really sick, well, I am, of the Zoom split screen, simultaneous action, different location choreography, which, you know, um, I think as well, we all need a bit of outdoor um, ambulatory choreographic propositions would actually feel really good. So. I'm kind of thinking the too big to um, too big to fail. You know, performing arts networks and festivals and educational in institutions will need to become too flexible or too adaptable to fail. Um, you know, of course, Jill's talked about distance technology solutions, particularly in education, that have come to the fore. Documentation methods. You know, dance videos, podcasts, 
task-based scores, um, apps that like what Jill's developed, you know, they help us to connect and to disseminate dance practices and ensure for us some form of pedagogical con continuity. But I think as well, we can be more creative and they can also create more diverse networks for dance. And here a great example is the online archival and networked choreographic process that um, the French collective La Horde um, put into place when they were creating a, a work of theirs called Tudabon, where they kind of collected like uh, YouTube jump stylers from all over the world and they used that as a way to um, create their piece and then bring people together. So it was hand in hand, this kind of um, cyber, uh, digital and um, uh, real presence. But, and this is the big but, of course, you know, the disembodied quality of online experience doesn't fully um, address our need to vibrate and resonate together. Um, you know, we need to share that embodied, intricate dance experience, um, which in reinforce our social capital and our networks. And if, you know, if those solutions, the digital ones were um, the fix, then music festivals would have died long ago with streaming, you know. And it goes deeper with dance because we know that privation of touch and physical contact is really deleterious to health, to physical and cerebral network development. And we've observed with our students, for example, that whilst distance learning allowed them to um, maintain a certain dance skill set and, you know, the, the connection with their, their teachers, um, progression was much slower and, and it was they didn't absorb new skill sets in the sense that it's much more difficult to integrate fine connections which pick up on 3D amplitude, textural and energetic layerings which are, you know, so important which give dance all of its interest basically and movement. So apart from the public health argument, you know, there's also pressing environmental considerations that we touched on over activity of this competitive globalization, which has been disastrous for um, biological and ecological networks. So yeah, physical touring will need to come calm down and when it does maybe we can think about also you know increasing duration of stay to warrant that kind of carbon footprint on the upside that may lead to greater depth of experience on the downside maybe that's just going to reinforce kind of cultural um pluropolies or monopolies that are already already kind of evident and practically speaking i'm thinking as well like unlike microorganisms which know no borders and they're happy to like hitch a ride on any host or surface like cruise ship plane animal human host um we humans um to propagate and flourish you know we are regulated by borders biological and digital controls visas customs immunization cards it's it's also travel is also contingent on our economic of course and time constraints so, you know, personally, I really have been re-examining our priorities um, at the Conservatoire National Supérieur de Musique et Danse de Lyon in terms of our educational networks and our international exchange programs. Like when I took over as director, um, guest teachers would kind of come in sometimes for one day to give a masterclass. And they'd come in for really short blocks of time to work with our um, youth dance company, the Jeune Ballet. Um, from far-flung locations. So, you know, that's going to change. That is changing. Um, it's, I'm trying to employ more local artists, give priority to international artists who can come by train, for example, um, partnering up, you know, caring about each other in our local networks. So we have the Lyon Opera Ballet, we have the Biennale of Dance and Contemporary Art here. We have a uh, Centre National Chorégraphique. So, you know, we buddy up and try and maximise resources and, and um, interchange within those tight networks, pres presential networks. In terms of student mobility and international um, exchange partnerships, you know, to some extent, yeah, they can take place by distance. It's much easier for theoretical subjects. I mean, I know because I, I gained my master's degree in public health by distance learning, but, you know, it's much trickier for that um, embodied experience for technique classes, choreographic laboratories and workshops. You can mitigate that slightly by, you know, exchanging professors rather than whole student groups, but that's less sexy for the students because, you know, the whole thrill of cultural exchange is kind of experiencing a culture in situ or dancing in an expanded cultural context. And I'm just going to finish up with something that I think, and Ella touched on this as well. Um, I really feel that process and documentation of the choreogra choreographic process will come to the fore and will overtake this 
notion of a definitive restitution or a performance of something. And this insistence on process, um, you know, at stages through the creation will also, you know, reframe, um, reconfigure, redefine our networks and our artistic communities. And to wrap up, I'd just like to finish with um, another Yvonne Rayner um, nugget of wisdom, um, a quote from the 70s, but it's interesting to, you know, link history with the future. She said, and I think this is really um, relevant still, the process is the product, the medium is the message, and the status will not be quo. That's it from me. Thank you very much, Kylie Walters, for your thoughts and um, your, I think, very important inputs. I would like to pass the word to Isabella because uh, the Migro Steps Festival, I mean, it also is a place where people meet, where people from all over the world, I mean, uh, Shia Shin would have been there, um, uh, Ella would have been there, of course, um, Mark would have been there. So you have to find new ways. So what is your sort of thoughts on what uh, Kylie was talking about, Short, cutting down on, on traveling? Well, on traveling, basically we had this, this discussion, um, we had this discussion and I got the feedback from some people that Steps is rather good because if they make move a whole company from New Zealand or from Australia or from California or from Shanghai, at least they stay for two or three weeks. So that was one thing, it, it's not for one gig coming in, it's, it's for, for a tour. And normally we try, honestly we try to get all the dates within Europe, not only in Switzerland, there is gonna be a tour in Switzerland, but then for other dates in Europe. So that has been the reality and we got compliments on that, but still, being in the situation of cancelling a whole festival and talking about ecological footprint, of course we are thinking of, of do we really want to stay that international or if we do, how can we even more interlace the international and the national dance scene? I think even more because, because when we invited them, they were just touring and they gave some master classes, but maybe because listening to Kylie, I was thinking about time and space. And I think this is one of the important aspects that Kylie just brought up. You know, if to, to go more local, yes, I think that's a good idea, but still to have this interaction internationally, I think this is very important, but maybe not just fly in and get out again. Um, <clears throat> Thinking about moments of residences, for example, or of masterclasses, but not one or two hours or one day, but on a longer on a longer term. I don't have the solution, but I think I'm very much thinking about time and space and the relation between national and international. Maybe Ella Rothschild. Yes. Uh, um, uh, oh. It's, I mean, it's for Isabella because I mean, one of um, the things. Jill, 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 can we? Oh. Uh, it was sorry. Ella starting. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry, sorry. Uh, I just wanted also to react to Isabella that I think that in the time that the borders are closing and that the, the, um, there is less and less movement, I think that more it needs to be important the international connection. And I do think that they should change or shift in some way to have a kind of a longer, uh, more further away view for the future. And again, not something that is just for now, again, performing for a certain uh, um, shows or, or, but maybe for longer processes uh, that can continue maybe for two years and not something that is uh, just for um, a specific show in a specific venue. Um, but I think this is an opportunity to actually make those connections deeper uh, and more uh, valuable in, in the terms of content that we are sharing between the our artist and the public, artist and the artistic director, festivals, companies, etc. Maybe I can share one thought from the audience with you in that field. Um, this from Marie Alexis. She writes, 
there is also another possibility making it more intimate, performing for smaller groups, entering a more personal relationship and exchange. But she asked the question, is there the danger of becoming very elite, very elitist? And I think that's what she wants to say. Yeah, I, I did talk about one-to-one -one, um, performances or kind of peep show um, type models and more intimate spaces or, you know, outdoors, you can kind of have uh, groups of people, um, perhaps. Sure, I think that's an option. And, and we know as well, I mean, even like, um, even with, with Gilles' um, sort of touring thing with the virtual um, VI, uh, V1, it, it does require like small groups of people. So it's very tricky sometimes for big festivals to incorporate that in their, in the way they're structured at this moment in time. But I think that will definitely come to the fore. That's one of my points. I think we're gonna to start to see different forms um, that, that are less the side dish on a programming menu and they kind of become, uh, you know, equals with pieces that are for theater spaces, et cetera. It, that's already been a tendency, but I think that will just uh, come more to the fore. Mark, I would like to address you in California. I mean, you, you also did a lot of workshops, you traveled a lot, uh, or you do travel a lot, and, which you don't do at the moment. So how, what is your thoughts about uh, this movement and pre-corona practice on that field, going to festivals, being a teacher? Yeah, definitely, Monica, thank you. Are you okay with me just to go into my presentation? Or do you want me to respond to that question? Yeah, maybe you can, you can sort of, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Start maybe your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay, definitely. Um, yeah, well, I'd firstly just acknowledge that at this time, uh, myself, Axis Dance Company, would have been in Switzerland at this time. It would have been the first time Axis had toured Switzerland and we would have been on a four-city tour. So our heart is also sad that we couldn't be there in person. Um, we're very grateful for this opportunity to connect with everyone uh, virtually. Um, I was going to talk, uh, give a little bit of a background to Axis Dance Company, just uh, just in the case not many people may know about the company. Um, and I had a little presentation, so I was going to show you some visuals, some photos, and see how they go. Uh, but please let me know if it doesn't work, because I'm not the most uh, tech savvy person. Can everyone see this? Great, tell me my control is gone. Um, but yeah, so I'm the artistic director of Access Dance Company. Uh, I'm a disabled dancer, choreographer, uh, and teacher. Uh, I've been artistic director with Access uh, for the last four years. Uh, I'm originally from Australia, uh, and have lived in most of my career has been in the UK uh, and Europe. Uh, Access Dance Company was founded in 1987. Access Dance Company is America's most acclaimed ensemble of disabled and non-disabled performance. And it really is a jewel in Oakland, California, here in the States. Uh, and Access is one of the most few performing organizations to be addressing and responding to people with disabilities. And we are uniquely positioned uh, to reach deeper and understanding these represented, underrepresented communities. Access has toured for over 100 cities in the USA, Israel, Europe, and Russia. Um, and this was going to be, as I mentioned, the first time in Switzerland. The company has received over eight Isadora Duncan Dance Awards and has appeared twice on Fox TV, So You Think You Dance, exposing the field of dance and disability to millions. Let me just go to the next slide. There we go. Um, through uh, the three pillars of activity, uh, artistry, engagement, and, and advocacy, Axis's mission is to change the face of dance and disability. Access provides unparalleled integrated dance education and outreach programs that engage people of all ages with and out without disabilities uh, to access dance opportunities uh, and create opportunities for recreation and professional dance training. Now in our 33rd season, Access is a leader in a discipline and a proud Oakland arts institution. Access redefines dance and disability and is a spirit of radical inclusion by commissioning, creating, and performing contemporary dance that is inclusive of disabled and non-disabled people and champion engagement opportunities as well as advocacy efforts that broaden the reach of physically integrated dance in the field. We're deepening the field 
and integrate across San Francisco, Bay Area and beyond that all bodies can dance. So what's really important for access is about our community, uh, our dance community, our disability community and the underrepresented community and how they can engage in dance. So for us, uh, when COVID-19 happened, being in the Bay Area, uh, being in a tech industry uh, world here, the tech companies were one of the first companies to sort of uh, implement staying at home. So now for, for me being in the Bay Area, we've been staying at home for over eight weeks and it's now been extended to the end of May. Uh, and we don't know what that's going to look like after that time. So we were, first of all, went into panic mode, went into crisis mode, and then went into production mode. Um, and we're really focused on our community. Like we're losing that engagement opportunity of the physical being in a space, connecting with people. But how do we connect that through online? So one of the first things that we did was uh, our access at home, which is about creating little uh, three minute videos uh, to engage with the community, to be fit, to look at fitness, to look at their well-being, to be active in their homes. And that was uh, presented by each of the dancers and myself, and they come out weekly on our social media platforms. The next thing, which I was a bit uh, resistant to at the beginning, was looking at uh, online dance classes. Um, but the wonderful thing about our access online classes is that it's been able to engage with people with disabilities who have been at home due to their medical conditions um, or their disability that have never had access to dance classes before. So something that Teresa mentioned about with technology, it also has created opportunities uh, for people in minority groups that have not felt comfortable or not had access due to barriers of uh, um, transportation, the cost of classes. And now uh, people from all around the world are accessing our classes uh, and they are for free, they're by donation. Um, so uh, we have, you know, over, I think 47 people that have been at one time in one of our classes. And we're offering a variety of different classes from yoga, uh, integrated yoga to uh, contemporary technique, uh, to general fitness classes as well. And one thing that we felt that was really important was um, was having, once again, that sense of community. So we began with uh, discussions after classes. So the opportunity for people to engage, have dialogue with each other, sharing how people are managing during this time um, and learning from each other as well during this time. Because one of the things I think that was one of the hardest for our dancers was as dancers, a lot of us weren't used to this type of technology and, and teaching with a screen and how do we engage with our, with our participants without having that physical presence. So it has really been a learning um, opportunity as well. The other thing that happened at the time, all of our touring got canceled, uh, all of our engagement work got canceled at the time of uh, COVID-19 when it began. We were doing our assembly program in schools and we were due to do our, um, our access uh, uh, performance for school children who, were, who would be bused into our theatre and uh, learn about inclusion and dance and physically integrated dance. Uh, and choreography and those performances couldn't happen so what we decided to do was build uh, break that performance up into seven videos using archive videos as well as um, recorded videos of myself and the dancers doing introductions to the work what are they going to learn about and then giving them a creative task as well as a worksheet that the students will have to then fill out questions they learn a dance word for the day and then they have a coloring in um, activity as well which represents people with and without disabilities and you can see from this video it was about making dance. So there's a subject and theme for every Access Online video. Another opportunity that we've been looking at uh, and engaging with our community virtually has been Access in Conversation that begins next Wednesday. So it really is about bringing friends of Access, allies of Access, people you know, internationally that's within our community who are allies to really begin conversations just like this. So people can connect and, and feel a part of community um, and the dance world while still being at home. Uh, Access's repertoire um, obviously is not being performed at the moment. So one thing we're also going to begin is looking at uh, different workshops that we can offer um, alongside of our company classes that will continue to the end of this month. Um, so we're doing different rep workshops as well as improvisation workshops, which is going to be a very interesting process for us, really exploring like how how do we explore a workshop that we would normally do in theater in the studio space uh, once again via online? 
One thing as well that um, has been really important for Axis is about um, creating um, and connecting with our audience, but in creating a safe space uh, for people to feel comfortable to be in this virtual world. A lot of people have done online programming and online classes, but not all of them have taken the account of accessibility. So with all of our uh, classes and all of our discussions, we offer ASL interpretation, we offer captioning, as well as audio description. So any video content that is a performance or excerpts, it's all been audio described. And because it's not live and it's recorded, that's really um, taken us in a new learning of how do we audio describe already videoed and documented work. We are now looking um, at next steps for us. What's it gonna look like us getting back into the studio? Uh, I'm meant to be at the moment creating a new work for the company's home season that is meant to be in October uh, at a theater here in San Francisco at Z Space. And, you know, working with Z Space and having a meeting with them yesterday, they're really open and looking at different ways that that performance may look at, look like. Is it about some of the things that were mentioned earlier about a number, smaller number of, of audience members? Um, we would need to be looking at virtual. So is there a way that it can be recorded? Because um, one thing that we want to take from this learning is we now have access to a lot of people um, around the world who have not had access to dance uh, and seeing this work of dance and disability. And we want to find a way that we could continue that even when we go back to live performance, whatever way that look, may look like. So we're considering smaller numbers, whether some performances are outdoors and also looking at live streaming um, and whether people can buy tickets or, or be able to make a donation to be able to watch those videos online. But I will just uh, finish just by saying through all of this, you know, we've, you know, obviously lost a lot of financial income from our work. We've had to work with our funders um, here in the Bay Area and being in America, the funding situation is very different. Um, so it's been our mission to really keep our artists employed. We have six dancers in the company and six staff, and we have managed to keep them employed. And that has been our focus, as well as supporting our community and being connected with our community. And I think just to, fin to finish, uh, one of Access's strengths and, and our work is about being resilient and adaptable and being able to pivot and looking at our programming to how we can continue that um, in these different means in a world that's changing every day. So that's the end of me. Thank you very much, uh, Mark from Oakland, California. I, what stuck to my mind uh, to, to, yeah, what I, what I heard was that you said beautifully, we, we switched from panic mode to production mode. And it really seems like this whole time actually was very inspiring for you instead of, uh, yeah, like closing up and having like all the bad thoughts about it. Maybe just a general overview view for, from all of you. It, it seems like this unusual times had sort of a creative impact. Am I wrong? Yonis, I don't know, Ella, she. <laughs> I, I will just start, but just by, um, I think when things happened, I was really unknowing where we were going. And I think um, there was, there was definitely that panic and that concern. And one thing I was really aware of, like as a leader uh, with my staff, my dancers was about showing compassion because we all um, deal and manage with crisis in different ways and that there was no just one prescribed way. So giving people space and to find ways to connect. So in the beginning, we would just meet like once a week and just check in with how people were doing. And then knowing that the longevity was going on, it was about trying to find a way that we could still, our work could still be meaningful and could still connect and connect with each other. So having that building um, uh, a regular routine sort of has helped us to, to build strength and community again. Yes, can I go? Yep. Just, just a comment. I, see, I think what is, was very interesting, what you were saying, is that you were talking about some new opportunities. And uh, for me as a creator, I don't feel like more inspired in this crisis. Maybe on the contrary, I'm very difficult. I have difficulty to concentrate. But still, I can see some new opportunities. And uh, in your case, Mark, I think that was very interesting that you, the fact that you reach out to communities, disabled communities that might not have access, and then suddenly, thanks to this crisis, they start to have an access. So 
you know, I think in terms of idea, we, we will always have ideas uh, to find ways as artists. But I think it's, it's, a, it's really a question of a paradigm that is changing. And, and when Isabella was talking also, uh, like, like a festival like Steps is in two years, but if it was next year, you might have even already difficulties to think that will you be able to invite touring companies, international companies next year? So do we really have the choice? You know, do we really have the choice? To, we need to go local because there's people will not travel to us. So, you know, like the solution we impose to ourselves, we, is, that's also what is very interesting, I think, in this crisis, is that we are forced to rethink, all of us, and you in Auckland, me in Geneva, and we have different situation, different structure, but we still have the same problem. We cannot travel, people cannot come to us, and we cannot go to them, and we can foresee that it's going to be this, the case for two or three years, maybe. So, but we have also to see the new opportunities. And I'm down with Kylie also, you know, let's, let's, let's be local, let's think local, let's, let's look around us. You know, in Geneva, we have a lot of international companies. We have like way enough people to, to fill up a full festival just by the local people with good quality, you know? Ioannis, yes. <laughs> Sorry, my mic was off. No, just uh, to say that uh, from all the things I heard until now and all the panelists, etc., there is a lot this question of more than being creative or finding solutions or problems. I feel, and this is actually very, very positive, that uh, there is a big sense of like, okay, suddenly we are responsible towards something. So some people will be more drawn to communication, some people more to ecology, some people more to health issues, something. But what you see, and I think this is what is important, is that this need of responsibility or responsabilizing ourselves towards every action that we are doing, um, which is actually an important thing. For example, when you deal with your physical body as a dancer, you have responsibilities also towards yourself, towards the others, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. I think maybe this is one of the one very important point is like we're not just playing anymore we're not just gonna maybe travel or do all these things it's like we have maybe to find other ways or 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 listen to each other so many different directions were said until now so for the, it, it is like sometimes it's like even opposite but there is a care about this behind this okay, I am responsible about one of those things that we talk about because that's what I feel really. And I think this is, this is a, 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 good, a good way of communicating uh, that, that this situation is obliging us to take. I, I agree with the honest that this notion of responsibility is being um, highlighted through this crisis. And it's also, I think, connected to it is also that we really have to uh, redefine our values, like individually, but also as a, as a, as a field. And for instance, this question of, of local versus international, which I think is an important question, I think had a lot to do with that um, 80s, 90s until now, we installed a, um, a, um, a hierarchy that working internationally was more valuable uh, in the, and what was more kind of successful and that both the media and the funding bodies would kind of um, use that also to support work um, and this should be kind of more horizontal and, and higher, without this hierarchy that it should be a choice as an artist to work more locally or more internationally and that it shouldn't be a, 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 a different values like that and if you give the people the choice they will make they will choose for themselves whether working with the local community is more important to them than international exchange. Um, and, and, that, and if they're, they're more equally valued and also in, in the support they get, then it will diversify automatically like that. Um, I have a question from the audience to Mark uh, specifically. It's about fundings and um, Jody Nicholson asks, the subject of accessibility in the arts dance is always something that comes up, especially when applying for funding. The question is, uh, does taking dance online for classes and performances, etc., help break down some of these accessibility barriers? What's your experience on that? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, 
I think our thinking always in regards to accessibility is to use it as a creative tool and not be using it as an afterthought. So as, as anyone's making work or anyone's devising a class, I think just always being aware of how do I make this as inclusive as I can to a, to, to a wider dance audience or dance participants. Um, but in regards to cost, you know, there are still costs with even online, like there are some programs where they can do automatic captioning. Um, but you would still, if you wanted to get live captioning by someone live doing captioning or uh, ASL sign language interpretation, um, audio description, then you would still need to pay. So here we would apply for funding to still be able to do that, just changing that from a live performance to online content. Um, but there are, you know, in regards to the tech world, there are different programs out there now as well um, to help, sort of also help support that. Okay. I don't see any, there's another question. Let me see. Uh, um, maybe we take that later. Is there any comment on, on that issue or shall we move on? I would, um, yeah, Kylie? Yeah, just about accessibility. It, it was really interesting during this whole two months of lockdown with our students because of course you have this problem of um, equity, like who has access uh, and some students were in very comfortable and are still in very comfortable situations in lockdown as well. We had like one day or two days to uh, stay where we were. So a lot of students couldn't take anything with them or they were stuck in their student um, you know, apartment with very little space. So um, the teaching staff were really aware that they had to prepare kind of online classes for students in totally different contexts. Like some had almost like studio spaces in their homes and others were really constrained with their telephone or a shitty internet connection. So this was one of the things and basically the solution we came up with on the run, because everything had to be done like that, was just doing follow-up, you know, like questionnaires, calling the students if we hadn't heard from them, if we saw that someone couldn't connect, like, you know, their colleague or one of their fellow students like would send them a little message or, and just trying to really follow up and see what the actual problems were, whether it was a thing of space or someone had three little sisters in the same room and they all had to do their online study program with their high school, or with their primary school. So they could not use that family computer to you know, do a Zoom class with us. So it, it was all these kind of weighing and then people in different time zones, like we have students in Japan and in Russia and you know, like, so the teachers would try and sort of delay classes or do split classes. So it's all this thing about equity of treatment, which is really important. Um, absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, I think we move on to um, China, passing the time zones, <laughs> talking of that, Kylie, um, to Xie Xin. Uh, welcome. We have not heard so much from you yet. So you have a dance theatre, you have been... Um, choreographer to many, many different companies in China. You've won awards. Uh, your company, of pro, uh, your personal company has been founded in 2014, if I'm right. And you would have been also uh, in Switzerland with a program called From In. It would have been your first time to Switzerland. Unfortunately, wow. you couldn't manage. Um, it's wonderful to have you on the screen. And um, let's listen to your thoughts on post Corona. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, now it's really late in China, so it's like a good evening. <laughs> I would love to show you guys a bit. This is my studio, so it's where my company working every day. Yeah. So this is our mm -hmm. own space, and as you can see, there is a schedule screen. And we're supposed to fly to Switzerland tonight, but now I'm still in Shanghai. <laughs> so, um, but I'm, I feel really appreciate now. Do you know why? It was in Chinese New Year, I, I, I'm in favor. And my daughter also in favor, like in one week. That time I really feel like I, in the dark place. I'm thinking about go to the hospital or no, because that time is really dangerous. But at the third day, I decided really go to there because I'm really 
um, concern about my daughter. So I have to know what the situation about myself. So, um, but I'm lucky, I'm healthy. But go through that when I every time saw the news from the TV, I feel really, really touching and moving from inside and really deep side of my heart. <laughs> I really can imagine that the people's in the situation, the what kind of feeling they are, because I saw the the news every day. So that's why I create a piece for one dancer, because I if. For that, I'm not as a dancer or choreographer, it's back to a human. If I am that person in that moment, I can feel that feeling. So I would love to help them to say goodbye to, to someone they love because they don't have chance. A lot of people, they don't have chance. Okay, so... Um, and also my next piece will back to the human side because I really want to go to deeper from my heart because I really go through what happened about the coronavirus in China. It really moves me, yeah. Okay, so let me introduce myself a bit. Um, I was born and grew up in China when I was in school, I was trained in Chinese traditional dance school. And late, later, I graduated from a contemporary dance program in Guangdong. And then I spent 10 years in four different contemporary dance companies in China. After that, in, 2000, in 2014, I founded my dance company, Shenzhen Dance Theater, in Shanghai. And we have eight full-time dancers and technical director and two managers. And it's obvious that coronavirus had a great impact on this world. Like um, our company, we already canceled at least 15 performance. And an uh, English dance company, Ballet Boys, they, who invited me to make a new piece for them they decided to put this creation, the new creation, online in the platform of Sutherland Wells and BBC Arts Cultural in uh, this in last month. And in China, as you know, the darkest period was from the end of January. Is the Chinese New Year, so that's why is um, everybody should be stay at home. And really follow the strict rules of the government. To me, it's not easy. And also, we are late for our schedule at least for one month, but we are already very lucky because our, a lot of theater, they still closed. They are not allowed to open for the perform for the performance, and maybe we'll. Um, starts from uh, July or August. Now we don't know. And it feels like it's press a pause button for, for my life. But it's a nice opportunity to prepare more for my next creation. So, um, for my creation is also the center. Uh, I will always, the center of my creation is the real theater. So no matter how the incredible, the virtual technology develop, the deep contact of human being and the criminal reaction between artists and audience will only take place in real space for me, only for me. So um, in China, we have a saying is out of the depth of misfortune comes belief. So the coronavirus is just a pause button for me. 
my dancers and I, we are, we are feel something new when we're back to the studio. We feel like it's really quiet and some new energy because um, in China, everybody used the internet every day and the app can teach and also have a lot of online performance. But for us, it's really a nice moment to really listen to ourselves and keep to our body for this three or four months. So um, I would love to say, I hope the, the world can keep back to the normal in the later few months. I hope the, uh, all the tour, all the tour, we can keep going because in the end of this year, we still have like a 13 performance in France and in many different places. So all my creation is very physical. So all my attention and concern is to go deeper and deeper with my body language to find more way of the connecting with other, others' potential and sharing the human emotions with the audience. The most important to me is to create a brand new image and aesthetics of Chinese contemporary dance. Because as you know, in China, the, the contemporary dance, the education is just a start from uh, 1985. So we, we don't have long history about contemporary dance. We only have 35 years. It's the same age, same years like me. So in last 30 years, we've been changed a lot. So um, it's really different situation between Europe or American or, you know, between China. So it's really different, but we have a very long history and we have a long and a very wide cultural. So for me, the most important is to create a brand new image. And for the 5,000 years of Chinese history, united with the energy of young generation on the international stage. So I deeply hope that one day we can meet in the theater. Yeah, so keep good, healthy, and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tixin in Shanghai. Um, yes, Ella, please share your thoughts on this. Oh, I was just clapping, but I can, I can say uh, that I can really relate to what you're saying, and I think that uh, we're in a humanitarian crisis and maybe it's not an artistic crisis and it's okay also to feel the loss that there is now the loss of life the loss of work and to mourn about that and then and it's okay to feel the way we feel also just as people and not necessarily as artists um, but I just I'm relating to what you're saying and um, yeah, as a human, as a person, I really feel sometimes my heart can is really soft when you when you go deep to this situation, you know. Not as a dancer or choreographer, but when, when I do the new creation, I really feel some energy already in my mind in, in my mind. So it's already changing a lot. Um I think you really uh there's no there's a response uh, from an audience uh, i think you really uh, sort of hit the, the on top of the the nail with with what you said uh, she says sarah again i wonder where we might take the gift of this moment for rest self-care introspection and reflection and bring those into a post-covid time for ourselves and for dance uh -huh. yeah I wonder, and that's my question to this, um, how, will, how will the interaction with the audience be? I mean, is the audience, maybe that's a, a question also to Teresa as a sociologist, is the audience 
Um, coming back, I mean, are they afraid of this physical art of dawn or what do you think? I mean, how is the reaction of the crisis? I mean, you do, you're specialized in that and you will give us a speech afterwards, but maybe just a short brief on. Yeah, I think that's a good question, but I, for me, I can think of it in terms of, very, of a very practical problem. And um, I mean, I'm not from the field, but I, I want to believe that there are solutions for this practical problem, just as Kylie already um, has described. So of course there will be people who are too afraid, uh, uh, who are, uh, whose health is not stable enough to act, even leave home. But I think many others are actually waiting to sit in a theater, even maybe only with, 50 other people and watch something. Um, so there are so many, in Germany now, it's again possible to uh, go to church. Why is it not possible to go to a theater? So this is um, a practical question. Um, and I think there can be practical solution. And then there are questions of how much does this cost and so on and so on. But um, yeah, this is, uh, how it looks, uh, at least from my perspective. Yeah, Kylie? Yeah, I was just going to make the point about these practical solutions. Um, we'll find them, like, you know, whether it's to do with how will audiences come in or how will, like, my students, are you might thinking about visors for all of them and, like, okay, maybe they won't, doing, won't be doing contact impro and duo work for a bit, but um, they can still practice movement and we'll find creative solutions to do that or maybe we'll split up the classes or a class will finish 10 minutes earlier so they don't cross over one another in the dressing room. Um, you know, they're, they're just practicalities. So you just have to kind of nut them out. Um, it, I think it'll just, you know, it'll obviously mean that we practice in a different way for certain times or maybe we can practice normally and then there'll be another wave and we have to sort of backpedal and, it's also weird for me. I work with adolescents and young adults and, you know, they're like in, they're in a non-risk group, not they're at risk, but like a tiny little my, my tip of my fingernail percentage. So in a way, they're kind of like raring to go. I'm like, ah, why cannot we, we go and dance? Isabella? I'm, I have the feeling, because we heard a lot, and me personally, I'm, I'm really missing like the energy cycle, you know, the energy cycle in the sense of, the, the artists proposing and the audience responding and people discussing after. So this kind of, because the virtual world is giving us a lot on the intellectual basis. And I was really fascinated by the world uh, Shil was proposing. But I have the feeling that we are made for, for getting in touch with each other on an intellectual way, on a, but on a physical way as well, and on a way of emotion. So I do hope, because the question was, will the public come back? I think they are going to be afraid. But I, I have the feeling they, have this, they are missing the same energy as I am missing. Just going to the theater, seeing, being touched, being in this cycle, or even hugging people, you know? So I do hope. And it was interesting because today, our church... In, in the village where I live, they just on the Facebook, they just demand that, okay, um, probably um, next week the schools are going to reopen. So the, the lockdown is going to be um, less, less towns. How do you people feel about? And the reactions were, there were some people say, great, let's go public again. And there were other people say, I'm, I'm really afraid. So I think it's going to, I have the feeling that public it's maybe not going to come back like in a crowd of thousand people but i think they will come back um some ways because they are missing more or less the same as i am missing i guess and i hope there's a survey um gilles jobin just um just mentioned it that 49 percent of those questioned uh, said they will likely wait a few months before returning to theaters and uh, only 25 said obviously yes let's let's do it and i need it and it's an urgency 
to to go back. Um, yeah, you, you want theater, to yeah. say? Sorry, just to, it's American theater, so it's American okay, audience. Thank you. Okay, Yannis. Yeah, no, just to to react to this need, uh, just a, a technical term which is very interesting that I learned when I worked actually with actors, is that even in in architecture, the experience of theater and the experience of being together. Uh, it's at least it was because I see it now in theaters that it's happening less and less. But the distances between the seats they have to be uh, apparently only one one elbow apart from the neb from your neighbor, because this is how emotions are traveling, and this is how in theater at least they can actually get all the power of the the, the this like Isabella you said between the artist the audience and all this energy rolling around. So even architects now is not happening anymore we see huge distances because uh, those places become multi places that we do many things inside but uh, in the origin this closeness is actually very important for the feeling to to go around so it, it, we are really put to the test here uh, for the future uh, what's going to happen let me have a little physical break. Um, Joel had, uh, she's one of the person taking the questions with, together with Maureen. And she said we should move a little bit so people get uh, also on the screens. Kylie, maybe you can start. <laughs> Give us a little lesson so we, we have like a little break until we continue. The I, shared my, I shared my screen. This is a photo of La Comédie in Geneva. And before they close down, they, they sit, the team sit in the theater to maintain social distancing. And I think it's a 300 seater and you can see that there's not many audience, if you want to respect. Do you see? Where's the audience? No, we don't see that Are picture. No, 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 no. A different picture, which is kind of like in the desert, so we can imagine yeah. we're in the desert with lots of sand around us. Oh, oh okay, okay. Let me let me let me do it differently. <laughs> okay, maybe um, Gabor can give us some information while we are moving uh, to how we proceed and how the audience can participate in this webinar. Yeah, I can sing for you while you move. So yeah, it's, uh, I think it's going really well. Uh, we have, uh, I just quickly checked uh, where people are from in our audience and I counted uh, about 20 different countries. Uh, at some point we were about 180 connected um, and, and people keep, keep, in sending, keep sending in uh, very interesting questions. I would like to encourage you, uh, the audience, to, to keep sending uh, your questions. Uh, as a little reminder, uh, we uh, wanted to organize this uh, this seminar, this panel discussion, in order to to um, to, to to give a little push into uh, towards uh, a creative thinking uh, post coronavirus. So uh, it's really the the creative part that we're interested in, not so much the the financial part. Of course, we're all. Um, worried about how how we'll survive financially but for now we would like to concentrate really on the um on the creative part of how how we might survive creative solutions and of course uh we don't give um uh, really uh, fixed solutions it's just a, a way to to start uh people's thoughts because uh, i myself was in a sort of a stupor for for two weeks or three weeks and i couldn't get myself to to, to think about uh, future and still nowadays it's quite difficult but uh, yeah <clears throat> one of the one of the goals is to get out of this and and, and try to try to get into a, a more uh, creative uh, atmosphere and creative thoughts so yeah bring on the questions and we try to answer them thank you very much uh, Gabor uh, co-host of this uh, webinar we talked about digital analog, we talked about uh, network, we talked about post-corona practice, we talked about important, uh, we talked about the audience being involved, maybe trying to get them back and what kind of uh, inspiration one can get uh, personally for um, creativity from the corona times, but also maybe 
being creative in uh, because it's difficult and um, because it needs some different ways of looking at things. I would like to continue. It's now 6 uh, p.m. in uh, Central Europe time. Uh, we're actually right on time as we planned it more or less. And I would like to continue with uh, Teresa Coloma Beck. She's a professor of for sociology in um, of globalization, and she will talk to us uh, also from her knowing what crises have, what kind of impact crises have, which is sort of a major. Uh, important um, focus of your studies and um, also the the importance maybe of culture in crisis. Teresa. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks again for uh, the invitation to this um, event. I felt like I'm five kilos smarter than I was <laughs> before this webinar started. Um, before I get to um, uh, my actual topic, I just wanted, want to make one prelim preliminary um, observation. We have been talking now about what is needed to move the energies in a theater? What is it possible? How much is it possible to transfer um, uh, experiences from the analog to the virtual reality? And I think something that we should keep in mind is that the way our experiences work, this is not a fixed thing. I mean, there are organic conditions, but they are formed in social processes. So in sociology, for example, Norbert Elias is one author who has studied um, how the structure of our effects, of our emotions and of our physical bodies changed. So one of my research subjects is violence. So I have been interested in what is needed to create bodies that are, have the capacity for violence or to create bodies who become, that become estranged from violence. Um, and uh, I think the same, the same, these very same or similar developments we will see in this sphere. And this very webinar has convinced me even more about this thesis because I have been in many Zoom conferences over the last uh, days and weeks and all with people from academia. And just sitting here with you people from the dance world, I can tell you this is such a different experience. So obviously already in this given moment, the capacity to transport emotions, a sense of the body varies a lot. So in most webinars or seminars, I have, in, I had, my hands were the only, the only hands that were ever to be seen on screen because everybody else was somehow sitting very stiffly. Um, so, and uh, I remember that uh, at one point in history, we learned to read bodies over the phone. So when we, on, when we are on a phone call with people we know, we know something about their bodies while we are just hearing their voices. So I think there are developments ahead and maybe not all in our lifetime, unfortunately, but um, I think maybe there are more, <laughs> more things will be possible than we even might uh, imagine. And it's interesting to think um, uh, that in everything that is happening right now, we or you are creating something. So you are bringing this into life. Um, while trying to solve very practical problems. So uh, we have heard a lot about these more practical problems and already very interesting solutions to these practical problems the pandemic um, uh, is producing. Um, I would like to think a bit more about why, it is, why I think it is so important to continue these artistic processes. Um, so um, I have already been introduced as a sociologist. I have been researching wars um, and especially everyday life in war zones for more than 15 years. I have spent longer time so field research in Angola, Mozambique, and uh, the last uh, stay was in Afghanistan. Um, so obviously I'm not a specialist uh, on pandemics nor on dance, but I feel I have learned quite a lot about how societies, how people function and in and deal with work with in existential crises. So um, uh, the research has produced insights on everyday life under extraordinary conditions, which I feel are um, also of relevance um, in this current moment. So against this background, it is that I now want to say something and I, I will focus on one point, why it is important um, 
to um, continue artistic productions. There are, of course, many aspects I found in Mark's presentation, for example, or also listening to Kylie, who's running a conservatory, you could see that there is always also this very social dimension. So places of art are places where people are coming together. There are public gatherings, which is of importance to um, also um, to especially open societies. But I would like to focus more on the role of art in this particular existential crisis of societal dimensions. Um, so existential crisis means we are in a situation where um, questions of life and death become important on the level of society. So not as individual problems, but collectively we are confronted um, with, these, with these questions. How this is experienced is, of course, uh, not the same all over the world. So the virus is the same all over the world, but the experience and the, the, the way, what actually is the content of the crisis is different um, in different places. So if you are living in a poor quarter somewhere in the global south, COVID-19 might be just another cause of pre-major death. Um, and uh, if you live in a war zone, um, being, not being able to leave your house is not such an unfamiliar experience as it is for us um, living in uh, Western Europe. Uh, us is not the right word here because we are a very diverse uh, um, uh, uh, panel here. But I guess you, I know, you, know, you know what I mean. Um, I think there is one particular problem um, that this existential nature of the crisis raises in society. I would, would use this blunt term that consider themselves modern because modern societies are built around fictions of control. So there is this idea um, that um, modernity is able to control the environment, to control nature, including um, individual human life. Therefore, modern societies are particularly badly prepared for an existential crisis because the confrontation with death or with the finality of your own existence is not supposed to be a societal problem. It is an individual problem. Sometimes it is a problem that concerns certain groups, women suffering from domestic abuse, refugees, but it is not the, the fiction wars that like on a global level, we have control over this because we have healthcare system, we have scientific progress and so on. So um, in this sense, modern societies, although they have a lot of fantastic infrastructure and knowledge to fight a pandemic um, are in a, an intellectual and effective sense not very well prepared to fight or to, to, to deal, fight is not a good word, to deal with this kind of situation. There's a very nice quote from um, uh, the uh, post-colonial thinker, Achille Mbembe, who wrote um, uh, an essay uh, recently um, on the corona situation. And he um, writes, I translated this uh, from French, under these conditions, it is one thing to be concerned about the death of the other from the distance. It is quite another thing to suddenly become aware of one's own putrability, is it putressibility, so perishability, to, ha to have to live in the neighborhood of one's own death, which is a now very nice phrase, to have to live in the neighborhood of one's own death to contemplate it as a real possibility. Um, and of course, people who are sick, um, they, know, they know this kind of experience, but suddenly this becomes a collective experience in uh, an overall society. So I would argue um, from a sociological perspective that this current situation is not only a health crisis and it is not only a, a, an economic crisis or a political crisis, it is also, and in a way, maybe one could say first and foremost, also a crisis of meaning um, on the individual level, as well as on the social level. I mean, on the individual level, um, many people who cannot continue their professions as they uh, used to, 
um, which is the case for people in the dance world, which is the case for people in research, they have question, they have crisis of meaning uh, in a very personal sense, but there is also a crisis of meaning um, in a social, in a societal dance. Um, and I would argue that especially in modern societies, the social field most um, suited for the reflection of these questions is art. Because in art, you can combine two dimensions as you can, I would argue, in no other sphere of the social. Namely, the dimension of knowledge and reason, of, of knowledge and reason on the one side, and the dimension of the living body of emotions and effects on the other side. Um, and therefore, artistic processes cannot only stimulate processes of reflection, because this is also done in politics, in research. I've seen that the time's up and I'm about to close. Um, artistic productions can reach people because they have these effective and, and, and bodily content. They can reach people in a way um, that no other um, practice can. And because they can do this, um, uh, because art can do this, art can stimulate much more than other types of knowledge production um, individual processes of reflection. Um, and this is not just um, a philosophical uh, concern, this is of imminent political relevance. If we live in a society where we do not have a language to talk about death, to talk about dying, to talk about pain, um, and to the, a language that we use in everyday life and w which in, uh, in certain yeah, variations we can transport to the public sphere, um, certain politics relating to the pandemic, they will be driven by fear. So I have observed in Germany, for example, it was very, very difficult um, even to talk about uh, older people in, um, uh, in homes for the elderly who said, I'd rather die of the virus um, than not seeing my grandchildren anymore. And this feels almost like a breach of a taboo because we are not, we, we have lost the ability to deal with these kinds of problems. And I don't want politicians to deal with these kinds of problems. This would, be a, this would also be possible as it has happened before, but it would be a very bad solution. So I really wish that um, you find ways to continue artistic um, production. And um, I only just realized um, uh, this dimension, which wasn't so clear uh, before this discussion to me, um, how important dance is when reflecting about the um, impact of these physical restrictions that are now posed on us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Teresa, for this very encouraging, um, yes, everybody thumbs up. Huh? And also there's a comment, and I think that sort of wraps it all uh, from the audience, Joost Frauenrats, or whatever his name is. He says, uh, this is so encouraging to hear. I encourage that we should be more convinced and encourage, encourage to share our knowledge as body pra practitioners to the field of academics. Probably wraps it a little bit um, what Teresa was uh, thinking and talking about. Mm -hmm. Any one wants to add something? Jill and Kylie, who is first? You decide. Just, just uh, maybe if you want to talk about what you have seen in those difficult places where people are in isolation, how do they react in terms of art? Do, do you see like some specific production, or, or on the contrary, people kind of like just do nothing for a while and I mean how what is the importance and how do you see it coming like, <coughs> like as 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 a practice of I mean from artists how I mean basically how do artists behave in such situations such extreme situations um, of course there is not one answer to this question but I can highlight a difference so my first researches were in sub-Sahara Africa and then I did this research in Afghanistan, two culturally very different contexts. Um, and everybody who reads newspapers knows a little bit about how Afghan society is configured. You have very strict rules on interaction in general, interaction between men and women. And you have um, rules that prohibit 
forms of expressiveness. Um, so me, me, everything that is performative art is politically and religiously um, difficult according to people with rather traditional or fundamentalist views. So um, just, and this is how to crystallize in one situation that I experienced is when I was in Kabul, one of the people I interacted with uh, uh, in the field, he once showed me a YouTube video of um, some kind of um, choreography that was recorded in a, a poor quarter. It looked like some kind of slum somewhere in Southern Africa. So in this video, there was like lively music, very rhythmic, uh, and young people were dancing very crazily to this music in a funny uh, choreography, shaking their hips and their arms and everything. Um, and this Afghan said to me, this is what I want to do. And this is what I cannot do. So um, I feel in, in, a, in a comparison of these two contexts, I had the very strong sense that there was in the African world context a source of resilience, which was in expressive practices, artistic practices, singing, which frequently then takes place in religious context, expressing yourself, also um, move your physical bodies along with other physical bodies. So all the things that we have been talking about. But this source of resilience is not there in the Afghan context, and especially people who were somehow connected to other places of the world, felt this um, almost violently, I can say. So it's not just a question of what kind of art is there, it's also a question of what are the political and cultural conditions then to, uh, to actually do this art. Kylie? Yeah, just picking up on that, that um, comment, Teresa, I felt that really strongly and, and I, I can totally get that when I was working more in the public health world and how you work on policy development and everyone's sitting on their butts and it's very cerebral and da 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 da, da. And, and there's kind of this, this barrier somehow that the information goes through in a, you know, in an intellectual way, but it's not yeah, embodied, I keep using this word, but it's a very different, it has a very different resonance, like, you know, how, especially if you're, you're talking about um, health promotion measures or, or public health measures, and, and this is a really important thing, like how do, and artists are great at that, artists are really great at, at that, um, communicating and helping us, us deal with, with things and, and getting to the essence of a problem rather than circling around it and always talking about what we should do and should not do because we know there are millions of different parameters and a lot of them are social and a lot of them are uh, physical. Um, you know, how we feel when we grieve over, uh, over a body of a loved one who we can't touch or all these situations that dance just nails it, um, you know, without being necessarily a narrative ballet or whatever, which could be horrific. But it just, in a gesture and in, in an embodied and in the way that it's done, all this weight and understanding um, can nail it, uh, you know, more than 100 pages of a policy document or something. And, and I felt this disconnect really um, strongly, which is why I kind of wanted to come back into dance. Mm -hmm. Or combine the two. <laughs> just came up to my mind. I mean, we're always talking about the system relevant jobs at the moment, like uh, public health and, and, and sales people and uh, cleaning and whatever, you know, and collecting trash, but maybe culture and art and dance is like the human relevant um, we, we need, you know, for the system. Yeah, I mean, I mean like, why aren't choreographers kind of organizing all, you know, how people go into shops, choreographing the, the streets and who can, we know it. We work with like hundreds of bodies every day. Like, you know, we could get people crawling and doing somersaults through this without getting into contact with people. And it's like, we've just been left out of the equation. But eh? Very beautiful thought. Thank you so much. I would like to continue with a next speech and it's by Guy. Um, Guy Kuhls, he's, um, where are you actually? In, in Ghent or in Vienna or where are you? Vienna, like. In Vienna. Vienna, um, Vienna like. 
Okay. Um, he is a dancer, critic, curator, and he uh, writes also books. And you work on a book at the moment, I think. Um, you are. You told me that you will be speaking on fundamental paradigm shift after Corona times. Please. Yeah, except that, that since we're already quite in in the discussion, I I want to connect as much as possible with the other people. So I'm kind of throwing out everything that I put on paper, uh, and I will kind of try to recompose it. Um, uh, in, in real time. I mean, the first thing was because I, I feel very connected to some of the points that Teresa was saying. Um, and I think a lot of my thinking about this crisis has to do with how Western modern society tries to control something that something that remains uncontrollable. Um, and I think as artists, we have to offer something about against this control narrative. And when I was preparing my, my presentation, um, by accident, I opened a document on my computer, which was an interview with Brian Eno, the musician composer, uh, when he was um, from 2010, when he was the artistic director of the Brighton Festival. And he said something very beautiful about this notion of control. And I just want to read that quote. It was going to be my, my final word, but I start with it now because it connects to what Teresa said. He said, like, I don't know if you've ever read much about the history of shipbuilding. Old wooden ships had to be constantly corked up because they leaked. When technology improved and they could make stiffer ships because of a different way of holding boards together, they broke up. So when they went back to making ships that didn't, so they went back to making ships that didn't fit together properly, ships that had flexion. The best vessels surrendered. They allowed themselves to be moved by the circumstances. And I think that's what artists are. We are vessels that are. Uh, allow ourselves to be moved by circumstances and as, as such we I experienced that also the first days of, of, of this of uh, when the lockdown came in uh, I think we, we were very much more proactive and we were quite resilient and I think we can you also we're used to be in situations of not knowing because that's, I think is the essence of a, any creative process uh, so we immediately there was kind of uh, a lot of also community building amongst each other but also towards our communities and a lot of support so this is the first thing i, I want to say i think that we have uh, this flexibility this ability to deal with not knowing uh, that we could also bring into other aspects of community the second thing which is connected to what uh, came up uh, i mean Xixin mentioned it and then uh, it was also now mentioned by teresa is that this notion of um in my own my own work recently, but it's it's the result of twenty years of of a practice uh, that's also very much uh, related to personal experiences. Uh, I've been work, studying and working a lot around uh, traditional to, uh, to traditions of laments, uh, amongst others in Greece and in Ireland. So lament as a way to accompany. Uh, mourning and to accompany grief uh, as an artistic way like it is both a, a, a community practice it is a, a therapeutic practice but it was also an artistic way so how to grieve for and mourn for the dead um, and actually before this crisis already happened we were um, working on, on different projects that try to find a new contemporary form uh, a ritual form to accompany that mourning process um, and not necessarily only for, for that but also for people to let go of, of have, like in any situation where we have a feeling of loss where you have to let go of things um, and some of the projects that were interrupted uh, by the COVID crisis were, this, uh, we were, we were supposed to make a, a big dance production in Greece um, with Kuna Huistein, who is a Flemish choreographer, and Rosal Batros Guerrero, who is his uh, Spanish-Swiss partner, and they were using the Greek traditional elements, but in a contemporary way. It was supposed to open in Avignon. It will now happen at a later moment. I've been working with um, a Brazilian choreographer, it's called Jean Abreu, who's based in London, and we've been researching how we can find a contemporary physical language uh, of lament because I think this has become more and more important to me in my own practice as a dance dramaturg. That it's not just only about creating a work that is successful in in the arts market, but it's very much also to create work that 
as is meaningful for the communities uh, that we are working with. Um, and if I was thinking about talking about this paradigm shift, I think is that's for me the main thing. Uh, it's also connected to something that Mark said about the crisis, as this highlights that it's it's no longer important to be successful in an arts market. But the first instance that we have is how how do we support uh, and continue to support the communities that we are part of. Um, and I think there's this has been for me the shift um, that has been going on for a while. Uh, I, I see that more and more artists are making that shift uh, already. Uh, another good example is somebody like like Dana Kasperson, which I highly admire. Uh, like she's she's been one of the key uh, uh, performers and and artistic thinkers of of uh, partners of William Forsyth and his company. But at one point. She also she did an online course in uh, conflict management. She did an MA, and then she started to make now work, which is kind of a way of social choreographing to support uh, communities to deal with conflict, whether it's immigrants or whether it's people in in prisons. And I think that kind of art form will be much more needed in the future. Uh, and artists that make that kind of shift, uh, I'm very confident that they also will be. Uh, uh, successful. I was going to, uh, so I already addressed that. It was one other topic I wanted to address a little bit more in detail. I think there's three um, uh, elements of um, that are that for me are existential uh, to my to our world, our field of dance, and that by this crisis were kind of shaken or or even threatened. Uh, we already talked about the question of mobility and local versus international. We already addressed the question of, uh, of liveliness. But there's this other question that for me is at the essence, which is uh, this notion of proximity that was also uh, brought up in some discussions. And in preparation of this, um, of this seminar, uh, I attended two similar seminars. There was one in Montreal, which was organized by the Choreographic Center of Vertigo. The title is Together at a of their seminar was Together at a Distance, The Body and Touching After Distancing. And then there was another seminar um, last weekend organized in Cyprus by Pelma, which is a dance organization. And they have a whole series, it's called In Touch with Touching. Uh, and then the seminar especially was called Arts and Constants of Trauma. And for me as a, as a dance dramaturg, like the, 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 the proxemics, which is kind of defined as the branch of knowledge that deals with the amount of space that people feel is necessary to be set between themselves and others, uh, is one of the key systems of meaning that we use in daily life, but also that I've been using as a dra dramaturg to analyze and to create uh, work. Um, and it is, it is because it's a, it's a, it's a subcategory of the study of no, nonverbal communication, but it's also a system that we all use consciously or unconsciously to give meaning to our reality and our express ourselves. And I agree with Teresa that this, these meanings, these systems, they can change over time also through the, the new technologies that we use, um, but it stays important. And I think this meaning is now shifting and even uh, being destroyed a little bit. Um, so I think there's also a quality there for us um, as a community that knows how to, as, as um, Kylie was saying, that knows how to choreograph uh, distance and proximity uh, to guide our communities in over the fear uh, and, and to show them also in the next stage that, that touch is not something that is transgressive, but that it's really li life necessity. It's a life necessity, as we also know that we need, children need to touch uh, to be healthy, like, uh. and so finally, because I, I think I have one minute left, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, so this paradigm shift uh, for me that I, I think is necessary within our own community, um, it was best articulated until now for me by uh, Adam Kraus, who's um, a Norwegian art theoretician, and he, he wrote this very small book, but it's a beautiful book. Um, it's called Art as Politics, the Future of Art and Community. And I, I just quote him again as a conclusion. I mean, Kraus is this, this idea that the arts should be a radically decentralized, integral part of a community and in the hands of anyone who wants to get involved 
is a central notion in the ecological version of progress. Rather than being tied to show business and the capitalist marketplace, art should be focused on becoming a part of its community. Rather than trying to make it in the mainstream cultural industry or the world of high art, an artist's goal should be to forge a better, stronger social order by bringing people together to collaborate and cooperate in the creation and production of their own culture. Or even more succinct in one sentence, rather than seeking to climb the ladders of the cultural industry of high art, artists needs to focus on providing meaningful works for the collective life of a functioning community. And what I feel with this crisis, it's, it's the economy that is the arts market that is shaken up. But as artists, we will come out stronger and we will just have to redefine our practices um, and uh, continue to support community building like that. Thank you very much. Um, Isabella is shaking and clapping. Uh, I think Isabella, I mean, you sent me uh, as preparation, you sent sort of this question, um, what is uh, the importance of, of dance and, and the role of dance for society? So Guy gave you the right answer, or the more questions from your side? Well, no, I think that there, Guy and, and as well Teresa pointed out that that dance is important because to me, I mean, I'm not the only one who claims that for me, dance is one of the most important elements in the world. But my question was, how can, how can we even more mediate the skills dancers have? We have like touched it in this discussion, but what I've heard is that there are so many skills, the dance world and the dancers can really propose to the society. And, and, yeah, I'm in the in the. I'm I'm not the artist. I'm here to really mediate and to try to make it public or to find ways how it goes, how it's shifting from the dance world to the to communities to society or whatsoever. So maybe yeah, let's that's... ask um, Guy and Teresa again. Mm -hmm. One of the things uh, I think that we can do, and what we already did, I was um, two or three, no, so maybe four years ago, um, I was asked. At that time, I was still connected to um, uh, uh, an art school in Holland, in Tilburg, which is the Fonte School for Performing Arts. And we, um, they asked me to conceive a project um, for which we applied for European funding within the education. And the project, there were originally there were like eight uh, dance education institutions from different countries come together. In the end, there were only three were able to participate. But it was out of the, the needs of the, the institutions themselves, we defined that the content would be what are all the other skills that dancers have than just the, next to their technical skills, which is the, the spatial skills, which is the, the, the skills of collaborating, uh, which all these skills. And how can we already, in the, the before they start a career, how can we in, um, highlight their own awareness of what they can offer to society and in different contexts. Uh, so already starting in dance education by not just only learning them dance technique, but also this awareness of these other skills. Um, and there's a, there's a website of this, uh, of this the result of this project, which I think is called uh, VVW Inclusive Dance, uh, where you get different testimonies about different skills of dancers being uh, able to apply it in different contexts like that. And again, more and more artists and choreographers, I think, are doing it. Like Dana Kasperson was just one example of many. Maybe, Teresa, one thought on that? Um, I don't really feel, how to say, feel well in answering this question because somehow my feeling is the, pra the practical competencies or the practical knowledge is part of then the artistic production. And um, there are so, so much talk about um, how to say, how to make art uh, economic, how to make it useful um, uh, in, a, yeah, in an economic sense um, that I, maybe in this discussion, I would be, I would be the advocate for uh, saying the function of art is to do art because no one else is doing it. <laughs> Uh, so <laughs> please don't all go into physiotherapy, although you will be wonderful physiotherapists. Um, uh, but 
the other thing is most important because it is you who can do this. Thank you so much. Um, just one comment uh, to all of you from Raffaele Giovanola Andras uh, saying where I connect to all of your comments is to underline how creators are so very fast in adapting and transforming problems into something creative. Even if it's a piece of art, a dance, or even the thoughts uh, you're sharing with us for the past two and a half hours. I would say we move on to our last speech, least, last but not least. Um, it's from uh, Yonis uh, Mandafunis. He's also a dancer and choreographer. And I think, um, Yonis, you send it to me what you are going to sort of sh uh, share with us. And I think it's like sort of the conclusion a little bit of the learnings, what we take along. Um, maybe you changed it spontaneously, I don't know, but um, let's listen to your, to your um, thoughts. And, uh, and I think then we're probably sort of last round and a wrap up and then it's, a, it's an end, but please, Johannes. Thank you. So, yes, as I had said uh, yesterday when we did our general rehearsal of the panel, uh, I'm dyslexic and I, I decided to write something. So I'm going to read it. But it's funny because from all what we said until now, uh, it actually, it's true that it maybe comes even in the right place, even if it was written before. So I have Isabella asking, so what dance can offer in general? And I have it written here. <laughs> and I have some quotes like this holistic experience that Ella was saying. And Kylie saying that dance can really nail this embodiment and these solutions. So I have this dance versus pol policies talking and stuff. And then we have this, this, the, the idea of lament, which is actually a little bit <laughs> in some exercise I will give you later. And the skills that can be applied from us uh, like to any other person. So I'm going to read it. So uh, the question was how we are good or we are skillful at uh, dealing with stress in dance. So dancers now are not that different from the rest of the people. And when it comes to manage their stress levels, many of us don't perform that well, actually. Many dancers are able to endure a lot of stress without losing their focus and their abilities but endure stress does not mean manage stress. I would suggest a few tips to manage stress instead of resisting to it, because I believe that the one thing that dance has to offer is versatility, adaptability, and unquestionable openness towards novelty and creativity. In my opinion, dance is one of the few art forms that has opened up to all the art forms that surround it to the extent of giving them the same importance than to their own art form. The example is like Gilles Jobin and his project, for example, we just said at the beginning, uh, one of example. This shows a great openness towards incoming information, informations uh, and our ability to incorporate these informations. So attention here, because there is a key word, is incorporation, or I would say more embodiment. Our art needs to to be incorporated or embodied into our physical body. Our body is the extension of the art form, and it's our tool, basically, the, of dance and choreography. The art of dance is inseparable from the artist's body and his experience. Since we all have a body on this planet, the idea of embodying any notion is a challenge that is being proposed actually to all of us and that unites us all. But dance has made embodiment a starting point and its own base for success in this field. For instance, when we feel stressed for a certain reason, the idea of being strong and resist to it is in total opposition to the notion of embodiment. Because it keeps the reason and the source of the stress out of our bodies, and therefore we do not have the chance to feel the nature, the quality, the quantity, etc. of this stress and even less the root uh, of our stress. So we built reflexes of protection instead of learning ways and using tools to deal with our stress and become more conscious in our lives. We push back opportunities of growth when we act that way 
And this is a reflex that all humans are struggling with, not only dancers. Instead, I would propose a simple practice now. So next time you're stressed, try to practice the following. The title of this exercise is Breathe at the Rhythm of Your Stress. So if you stress a lot, try to breathe a lot and breathe fast and breathe really strong. If that makes you want to cry, cry a lot. Uh, scream, scream a lot. You want to punch something, punch it really hard, your pillow or whatever. You want to jump, roll, whatever. Just do it uh, to the extreme of it and don't judge it at all. By doing so, uh, you will give space to the emotions you are going through. So basically, you are going to embody them. And by repeating this kind of practice in the everyday life, you will slowly, slowly um, come into contact with the emotional reasons of the stress. At this stage, a transformation is taking place. I can say it personally from uh, the studio or being on stage that this transformation, it's actually, it's there. We pass from stress to realize that we are not stressed. It's actually fear. Without going into the medical definition of it, I would simply put it that way. Stress is the behavior we have adopted towards our sensation of fear when we don't know where it comes from and we don't know how to deal with it. A sensation of being submerged and unable to find any solution at that point. So let's exercise ourselves to align our being with our emotions until we feel we have passed from the sensation of stress to the one of fear. So we have to recognize this. And this is why, I, that's what I feel and I believe. I believe that fear is something you can face. At one point you can face it. Stress is something we are victims of. So by practicing the passage of from the notion uh, from one notion to the other we become actors of this transformation and suddenly able to deal with the situation we're in now within fear we are one step closer to finding a real way to manage this problem now we have to keep on digging into the emotion of fear keep on breathing moving running crying rolling etc etc jump whatever again just do what comes and do it don't judge it at all do it fully um, do it until the fear has penetrated like to the deepest part of your body and brace it fully make it maybe even more dramatic and more extreme than it is in reality in order to make it really visible and palpable this goes a bit to the the lament situation that that i actually saw one time in greece for real it was almost surreal and extreme so basically I propose that you experience your fear full on and look at the fear right in the eyes. When your made up crisis will be gone, you will feel a great sense of freedom. You will feel that your body, your emotions and your thoughts will have been going through something but all together and fully. And here comes the most interesting part in my opinion. Even if you're alone in that room practicing this made up drama, you could feel that you are not alone facing your fear anymore. You could also feel that you are not, uh, 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 that you are more than one person in that room. It's like, it's a bit like magic. And this is why it's because it is rare that all of our bodies, physical, emotional, mental, and our personality are together active into one direction and for one purpose. Usually we think one thing, we feel another, and we act a third thing. It's comical, but that's how we are made as humans. This is normal because our, our emotions make us feel, our thoughts make us think, and our physical body acts, and our personality is our interface with the outside world, and so on. Every one of those bodies has his role to play. These bodies can act independently, but they can also act connected. This is what I called uh, our bodies. So when we practice the way I just proposed above, what happens is that our bodies act as one aligned unit. Usually all these aspects are dismantled. Now, these tools, we start feeling the, the existence of the multitude of the bodies within ourselves. So this is a lot of people in one body, of course, I agree. It's a lot of voices to hear also and a lot of work to align all these crowds. We are not schizophrenic uh, though, nor bipolar at that point. We are just getting in touch 
with the whole of us. The more we practice, the more we feel that one body supports the other in its quest. Being in peace with the alignment of all our bodies is an exciting perspective though for life. We learn new ways of listening to our bodies that often tell us clearly what we have to do, but usually we pass by without realizing it. The more we accept this whole process, stress disappears and it's in its place we see people being present and busy dealing with reality, practicing reality, facing reality. This is what I call an active embodied posture in life. So when we take things one after the other and we practice them in order to embody them, it allows us to travel and feel the origin of every subject we are dealing with. This is a very dense, of course, and dancers like approach. And this is what I believe dance has to offer to create practices in order to increase our versatility and share it with anybody. But these practices should enable people to become more conscious of themselves and their environment rather than more productive within their environment. Otherwise, we could lose this big openness dance is made of. Creativity can be, of course, very productive, but often we have to go through total unproductive and total unorthodox paths in order to concretize abstract ideas and put them into a form. This is inevitable and necessary. Movement-wise, I would say that this COVID-19 situation obliges us to be really conscious about our every distance, every contact, every move, et cetera, et cetera. So our habits are put to the test. So to finish, let's say that maybe dance could propose the following. Let's, start, let's take a step into the art of practice. Voila. Thank you so much. Yeah, let's shake the hands for Yannis, uh, Ioannis. Um, I think this is a wonderful closing statement for this discussion we had for two and a half, almost three hours. Thank you so much. Um, maybe we do just a brief closer wrap up with Isabella. Isabella, um, is there anything to add from your side? Well, there's a lot and there's nothing. <laughs> well, from my side, I can say thank you so much for this panel. A lot of people on this panel, I knew them. There were some, some people I didn't know so much. And I was really, I was really happy to discover thoughts and, and sharing a lot of thoughts. Maybe a wrap up, I don't know, it's very personal, but, but there are some words sticking with me, which is like redefine value responsibility, take care of communities, dance has the capacity to transport emotions, and well in my case it's not providing meaning, meaningful words, in my case it's like looking for them or um, searching for them and being able to propose them later to a public. So I, I'm, I'm really, really glad. And um, there was in the chat, um, there was a question, I don't know, maybe Gabor can answer it because there was the question if just the panelist could stay within this room for personal say goodbye. I'm not sure if this is possible or not. I think Gabor could answer this question. Uh, yeah, technical question. I have no idea how to kick out all the audience. So instead I scheduled uh, another short bye-bye session for all the panelists. So uh, whenever uh, I posted it in our, in our chat, uh, please uh, save the link. And once this is over, which is going to be very soon, uh, we'll see each other for another five, ten minutes just to say, just to say bye. But uh, a few a few words to from me to to wrap up. I've been really impressed by by all the content and from and and all the angles that you 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 came at this um, at this topic. And I think we we've just um, got what we wanted is uh, lines uh, like thought lines that that we. I, I'm I'll, personally I think I'll be busy for I don't know for weeks with everything I've just heard and. And we'll have uh, we'll have the the recording. So for for people who could not 
be here, could not listen to you talk. Uh, we'll have the, the whole panel discussion available uh, on the Facebook uh, feed of uh, steps as well as the website probably. And there will be a document also that, uh, that will regroup the, like most of the thoughts. So from my part to all the panelists, thank you so, so much for what you have given us. We're very lucky. Uh, to the audience, thank you for, for the questions. Uh, we're very sorry that we could not answer everything. Uh, we tried to, to stay within the theme, so, uh, so some questions were a bit put aside, but uh, maybe we can find a way to, to answer these questions later. Okay, so that means, that means we say good goodbye to our public, basically. Thank you for being with us. Thank goodbye. you. Goodbye. Goodbye, so much, everyone. We can all say goodbye. Bye, 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 bye. bye, bye. Uh, Ella, Mark, Guy, Ioannis, uh, Shishin, and uh, Gilles, and Gabor, and Isabel. Monica. <laughs> See you in a second. Bye. 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 bye.